Okay, sorry about that, guys. Let me know if you can hear me now. Um, I had a thunderstorm this afternoon and the power went out. Um, hi, Ruby. Can anyone hear? Can you just look all good now? Good, thank you. I've got this on mute um, just until the trial starts. So it should be about just under 10 minutes now. I think it's going to be a Zoom meeting. Sorry about that. I didn't realise that it went and reset everything. Hi, Yuvi. Hi, MJ. Um, so, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, just you can't see it on here, but to the side in the chat. Um seems to be a bit of um, mixed feelings about Ross Harris um, about his innocence or you know guilt people are saying that they think he's innocent beyond the accusations of sexting which is what I say um, another one says hard to believe anyone would forget their baby like that uh, hi, Jack Lucy, bro. Hi, Yuvi. Um, welcome. And I'm not sure how long this is going to run for. So they've set aside three days for it. Um, what that means, I have no idea. Um, like I said, it's almost midnight here, but I will do my best to cover this because it really is an interesting case in a lot of different aspects and if I don't know if anyone's listened to the closing arguments of the defense but it's one of the most powerful arguments closing arguments I have ever heard in a trial I was at the end of it I was like determined like convinced that he wasn't going to be found guilty and the, the big part of this um, applying for a retrial, which has taken four years uh, to, to get to this point, um, is, like I said earlier today, uh, joinder. Um, so counts one to five are to do with the death of his son, Cooper. But counts six, seven and eight are to do with the sexting and lewd pictures to an underage girl. And so in Joinder, they will join, you know, those separate charges together uh, like they might join uh, more than one defendant in a trial. Uh, rather than trying them separately. So that's the biggest issue with this because they're saying had they're, t they're two so totally different incidences. One is murder, felony murder or malice murder. The other one is um, whatever the charge was, um, you know, for an underage girl. And so if they had been tried separately, would the jury have looked at him differently than the way that they did? I mean, this whole trial played out like a soap opera. Um, you know, the, the prosecution just hammered home that he was sexting all of these girls and going to prostitutes and all the rest of it. So would, would there have been a different outcome now, he got 32 years on count six to eight. He got life without parole on counts one to five. So in the state of Georgia, he it's malice murder. So it's kind of like murder one, you know, first degree. Uh, so premeditation. And you can also be charged with felony murder. Um, like I said earlier today also, um negligent homicide wasn't offered on the, it wasn't put on the table by the prosecution um so if he got a retrial 
would they put that on? Could they possibly put that on? You know, it changes the game from never getting out of prison to possibly in, you know, 20 years or so, but still, um, he was fairly young. I think, you know, he was early 30s, I, I believe, um, when he went to prison. Um, and um, you'll see the, well, you'll see it when um, when we go live, live with this in, in a moment that um, prison hasn't bode well for him. Um, not that it would really bode well for many people, but, you know. Uh, so I'll take this off mute when they start. Um, I anticipate it's going to start on time, being that it's a Zoom meeting and also... Um, you know, there's not going to be heaps of people there, you know, trying to shuffle, um, which can usually make a trial run late. Um, so yeah, I don't know how long they're setting aside each day for this. I'm kind of like, as much as I love this trial, um, and want to see a retrial, I'm hoping it doesn't go for eight hours. <laughs> I really, really don't. Um, you know, seven, eight hours, because it's almost, what, nine o'clock in Georgia and Cobb County. And, um, yeah, sorry, I was just reading some of the comments. An example, uh, the police have lied about his online searches, or at least taken them out of context. And they did. They did. Um... Jack, you've been watching a lot of the videos. You don't understand why they went after him as doing it on purpose instead of negligence. I just honestly think it was a witch hunt. I think it was, we're going to make an example out of you. There's only a handful, maybe maybe 10 or so, that I saw of people being charged. Not just parents. Remember that one, the daycare worker? And she didn't do a proper sweep of the um the daycare van and there was a little boy in there and he died now they didn't uh make an example out of her the way they did with ross harris um he goes by ross not justin so you know because she wasn't the parent but you know they didn't I, th I think for her it was more a negligent kind of charge rather than malice and that because if you're a parent then there's this, I think, this stigma that it, it could be premeditated. And so I they really made an example out of him. Had he not been texting these girls and seeing prostitutes and things like that, I think it would have been a very different trial and I think that... Um, negligent homicide could have been an option there for the jury. Um, I don't know what you guys think. Um, meanwhile, on Law and Crime, you can get plexidermatrial.com. Get it for only fourteen ninety five. Call 1-800-632-1058. Look at that results they speak for themselves it's like a kid dies and you're investigating what happened and your thoughts go to doing it on purpose yeah i um i don't know i just didn't like these investigators <laughs> sponsor me <laughs> rapid reduction serum I've tried that stuff. Actually kind of works, but it's kind of like you've got a snail on your face, like crawling on your face. <sighs> da, 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 da. Live trial, live stream. I don't know why there's a link to this 
live stream when I think I think we're on the right oh no here we go Fred, are you on? Can you hear me? It's Kathy. Kathy, yeah. Kathy we can hear you. Yeah, oh, thank you. It's midnight, Jack. I'm just going to mute my mic. Hang on. Hey, Chad, I um, just heard from the courtroom. They do back at 1.30. Okay. All right. So, and Anthony, you see that? We're going to, we have to come back at 1.30. All right. Sounds good. All right. And I'll call you in a second. All right, Jay. All right. Thanks. All right. Yes, sir.
Hey Mitch, your screen sharing, could you uh stop doing that? Okay, hello.
No, no, don't. Don't, don't, don't start. Um, Good morning, Mr. Harris. Um, we're going to start, start briefly. Thank you. Okay.
All rise. Three or four of five counties now in session. Honorable Mary State. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's see, we have the matter of the state of Georgia versus Justin Moss Harris on the motions for 
new trial. Is the state ready to go forward? Yes, Your Honor. Linda Donikoski for the state, and the state is ready. How about the defense? Is the defense ready to go forward? Uh, yes, ma'am. And I see that the defendant is present as well electronically. Uh, these hearings are being held in an open courtroom with the deputy present. So we're complying with open courtroom constitutional provisions of the state of Georgia and the, and the United States of America. Um, pursuant to the judicial emergency declared by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Georgia in light of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, much of this hearing is going to be held virtually. Um, the state is here via Zoom, Defense Council is here via Zoom, and the defendant is here via Zoom. Um, I think that makes a record for that. Is there anything to that record that the state would like to add? No, Your Honor. Is there anything uh, to that that the defense would like to add? Mr. Durham, you're, you're muted, muted. Push your button. I'm looking for it. <laughs> uh, I believe my answer Found is that I, I don't have anything else that I can think of at this time. <laughs> You better learn how to push that button or we're going to have a really uh, awesome I, I, I'm, I'm worried about that, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take the Rule 22s first. I've got Rules 22 from, um, well, W uh, from uh, CBS 46. I've got a Rule 22, WSB TV. Fox 5, Law and Crime Network, Atlanta Journal Constitution, Marietta Daily Journal, WXIA TV. What are the state's positions on those Rule 22s from those outlets? Your Honor, we have no position. It's an open courtroom and we believe in going ahead and letting the public see this. So we have no objection. And what do you say, Mr. Durham, on behalf of Mr. Harris? We'll stand silent on this issue, Judge. All right, well, I'm gonna sign off on all of them. Who are you here with? Are you doing a, a, a pool or what? You, yeah, y'all, you all. <laughs> I didn't know who was here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and uh, is there a pool or what are you doing? Okay, great. Okay, do y'all have everything that you need? And we're good to go forward. Okay, Ms. Tyler, is there anything else to be done with that? All right, all right. Uh, addressing myself to the state and the defense, we're ready to go forward. Um, is there anything before we get into argument that needs to be discussed or developed for the state? No, Your Honor. Um, there is the matter, I believe, just of the state's motion to exclude the testimony of Dr. David Diamond at the motion for new trial hearing that I filed on December 10th, but I want to let the court know that Mr. Durham and I have subsequently spoken, and we believe we have kind of resolved this issue, and we just need to let the court know about that. All right. Mr. Durham? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in regards to uh, 13, I'll tell you specifically, um, the, uh, there's a, a PowerPoint that we have, and I believe it's listed as uh, Defendant's Exhibit 3. Um, I was going to have Dr. Diamond testify from that in our proffer, but um, I'm not going to do that. I do plan on introducing that, um, for, uh, but we're not gonna be using it to base his testimony today on, on the proffer. Um, the, uh, I, I will say that, you know, there was some confusion and when you have a record of about 12,000 pages or actually probably more than that, you're going, uh, you can uh, get hidden. And there are two pages where they referenced this um, out of the entire transcript that I can see they referenced this, but there was some discussion uh, by between the state's council and the defense council on the record about how they were going to handle the um, PowerPoint. It was a work in progress and that they were going to get together 
see if they could resolve any uh, objections because the state did have uh, objections to certain slides and uh, the ones that they couldn't, they were planning on coming back to the court. Uh, that never came about because Dr. Diamond was not testified or uh, was not called to testify. So with that, um, just wanted to let the court know that, you know, uh, we will be putting him up. Um, and although we're going to introduce the slide, we're not going to go through it on his uh, testimony of the proper. All right. Uh, does that take care of all preliminary matters before the court until we get into argument? Well, uh, probably not, Judge. Um, I can tell you that we, if you notice, the state has, excuse me, not the state, um, they, uh, we have filed in defense uh, a few motions, um, a few enumerations of error, I guess is the best way to phrase it, for the motion for new trial. Trial counsel filed one shortly after um, the trial was over. And uh, it's uh, a little bit more detailed than the normal um, motion for new trial is filed on the, uh, the general grounds, but they listed some 20 um, specific enumerations uh, of error. Um, and we will be preserving all of those. We're not gonna argue all of those. Some of those we're gonna submit on the record, but um, there's some others that we need to present evidence on. Um, to uh, further the arguments. And before we do get into the arguments, uh, I, I would like to have the opportunity to call um, the witnesses and things. All right, well, I think you should do your witnesses for examination and cross-examination before argument without doubt. Are you ready to do so? I hope so. Um, I need to um, contact um, uh, I've got, I don't know if we've gotten him and that, that would be my fault. I've got to get, Dr. Diamond uh, is available to testify. I need to send him, I guess, this link, which um, I, I thought I did, maybe I didn't. If I could just do that right now and uh, I'll make sure we get that to him. I, I had a hard time finding the link this morning myself. So if I can go ahead and do that. Please. And Your Honor, while Mr. Durham does that, I believe Mr. Kilgore, Mr. Rodriguez, and Mr. Lumpkin are also um, going to be called as witnesses, and I know they have joined us. Um, I don't know what the court's uh, procedure is for having them wait in the waiting room pending their testimony. They will. That, if, I mean, if you're asking them to be sequestered and yes, making, yes. making a motion for sequestration of the witnesses, they can be put in waiting room. Um, Mr. Conway, can you help with that? Uh, it'll be Mr. Uh, Kilgore, Mr. Lumpkin, and Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Judge. Audrey. What's going on with this 130 calendar? Is someone helping us or am I gonna to have to break in and do it? For him? No. Why, did something happen Judge Paul? It had to happen, you know.
Red and blue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Um, I did not realize this, but he is in, I think he's now in the waiting room, so. Let's see what Mr. Donnelly can do to help. Mr. Donnelly, is it Mr. or Doctor? Doctor, please. Doctor Donnelly. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can. Sir. Can you see him? Yes, ma'am. He's right below me. Well, my screen's below me, so. I'm not seeing him. Oh, there, there. There's Dr. Diamond. All right. Is that, is, are you calling him as a witness, Mr. Durham? Uh, yes, ma'am. Will you swear him in, please? Uh, Dr. Diamond, would you raise your right hand, please? You swear from the testimony you're about to give this court in the matter pending before it should leave the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be called. Do you so swear, Dr. Diamond? Yes, I do. All right. Mr. Durham, if you'll proceed with your examination, please, sir. <laughs> Very well, Judge. Um, Dr. Diamond, uh, tell us who you are, please. Could I, uh, I'm sorry, before you start, it, it is difficult for me to hear um, Judge, Judge speaking, and it's a bit muffled. I just want to let you know in, in advance. Well, I'm the only one wearing the mask, so yes, that's true. But when you can't hear me, if you need to hear me, if you'll do what you just did and speak up, I'll be happy to do my best to help you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And also, Dr. Diamond, given it being a Zoom hearing, if uh, any questions I ask you or the state ask you that you have an uh, inability to uh, hear clearly, please let us know. Okay. All right, uh, tell us who you are, please. I'm David Diamond. I um, have a specialty in the study of the brain and memory. I received my bi bachelor's degree in biology, University of California, Irvine in 1980. My PhD in biology with a specialization in neuroscience, also from the University of California, Irvine in 1985. And I've studied the brain and memory now for over 40 years. Okay, what are you currently working at? Uh, what topic am I working on or where am I? Well, uh, what, I mean, do you have a, um, are you working in a, a specific facility right now? Yes. So I'm a professor at the University of South Florida in the Department of Psychology. And uh, you mentioned you had a PhD. What, uh, where was the PhD from? I didn't miss that. University of California at Irvine. Okay. Now, um, have you, uh, how long have you been uh, in the field of uh, studying brain memory? 
So I've been studying brain and memory now actually for over 40 years. Do you have any other areas of expertise? Uh, well, that is my primary area of expertise is all about the brain, memory. Um, and in the past 15 years, I've been focusing on uh, how children are forgotten in cars. And um, so on your brain, uh, the brain memory issue we talked about, um, you said that was, you've been doing that for uh, over 40 years. Have you, um, do you teach classes on that? Yeah, so I teach primarily undergraduate classes on the brain and memory and learning. Um, I also teach graduate students and I've given lectures to the public, including lay people um, and people involved actually in getting accredited um, healthcare workers. So I also include that in the study, a uh, lecture on brain and memory. And um, how about uh, any published articles? So in my 40 years of research, I've published well over a hundred papers in peer reviewed medical journals, almost exclusively on uh, brain and memory. Now you had mentioned the last 15 years, um, you're kind of a focusing on forgotten children in cars. That, that's correct. Um, what, what, what work have you done in that area? So uh, what I've done at this time is to try to understand how it is that uh, otherwise good, uh, attentive, normal, loving parents can leave children in cars. So I have studied um, the circumstances in which these events occur. I've developed hypotheses to try to understand this from a neurobiological perspective. I've interviewed dozens of parents. I have read about these cases and I have testified in cases, both civil and criminal cases, when these parents have been charged. And um, have you ever been uh, declared an expert uh, for the testimony in these cases? Yes, I have numerous times. Now, have you written articles regarding um, uh, specifically uh, dealing with uh, forgotten children in crime? Yes, yeah, so I have an online article um, in which I wrote about this initially a, a few years ago. I have also published a paper in a peer reviewed medical journal specifically on uh, how it is that parents forget children in cars and it's in a medical legal journal. So it also included uh, legal aspects. And uh, what about any teaching in that? Have you had an occasion to teach in this aspect? So when I teach about the brain and memory, I include in my lectures and my curriculum description of these cases that children have been forgotten in cars and I diagram for the students um, how it is that this happened according to my hypotheses. Now, the, uh, the things that you're doing uh, and you've been doing the last 40 years, um, is this type of research, are there other uh, doctors doing similar type research? So I have a specialty in post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. I was employed by the Veterans uh, Administration for 30 years until I retired a few years ago. I received continuous funding from the VA for my research. I've also published work on Alzheimer's disease and uh, traumatic brain injury. Now, um, so the, um, the areas that we talked about, um, uh, have you testified uh, previously, you mentioned uh, in regards to child cases where they were forgotten in cars? Yes, I have testified as an expert witness. And have you testified in trials in uh, other areas regarding brain memory? You know, the only trials in which I've actually testified as an expert have been specifically about brain and memory. Now, when you were, we'll deal with the ones we're uh, dealing with uh, um, children that forgotten in cars. Uh, have you ever uh, consulted with any uh, the government or prosecutors? Yes, I've been contacted by prosecutors on a few occasions um, asking for my input. Okay, and have you been, um, worked on uh, cases also for defendants? Yes, I've also been contacted um, by the defense attorneys um, uh, numerous times. 
And I believe you said you have been called, uh, qualified as an expert in those cases and uh, to testified in some of those cases. That's correct. Are you ever not allowed to testify as an expert? I've never been denied as an expert to testify. Now, um, in your in your work here, you, you mentioned you do a lot of work on these. Can uh, um, in your in your field? Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the, the cases you've done? Well, the the cases uh, uh, have, in a sense, a bit in common. I have studied how um, parents have gone through routines, and I've looked at commonalities in these cases. Uh, one of the first cases that I had and which I studied was Lynn Balfour, which is over a, a decade ago. And so she had a routine that she went through to be able to take her child to work on certain days. Her husband would take the child to work on other days. They had a change of schedule. And so instead of taking her child to work um, uh, on that day, she had actually anticipated it was a day in which she normally would have been driving from home directly to work. So in this case, she followed her routine and lost awareness of her child in the car. On top of that, it was a very stressful drive. Um, and so that contributed in my theorizing as to why it was she lost awareness of her child. Um, and so she got to work, she exited the car, left her child in the car and during the day the car heated up and the child died of heat stroke that's one example okay now um you know i, I did i don't know if i would ask you this and i probably should have earlier but have you done uh, any work with uh groups uh specifically, specifically uh concentrated uh, on forgetting children in cars yes i have so I learned about a child being forgotten in a car 16 years ago. And at the time I had no concept as to how it was possible for a parent to forget a child in a car. So I conducted some research and found an organization called kidsincars.org. And so these are people who monitor the different ways in which children die in cars. I contacted them, I have worked with them for the past 16 years, um, they include some of my work at their website. So this is a group that I'm intimately involved with to enhance safety of children in cars. Okay, and have you ever worked on legislation or with any government agencies? Yes, so the kidsincars.org organization has promoted the development of federal legislation to mandate that there be um, uh, child detection system in all cars as federal law. I worked with them in going to Washington DC and lobbying for approval of this, which is called the Hot Cars Act. I met with senators and House of Representatives individuals and spoke with them about how it is that children are forgotten in cars by good and attentive parents and helped to explain this to them and how it, why it was so important for them to pass this legislation. Thank you. Uh, Judge, this time I'd like to go ahead and uh, tender Dr. David Diamond as an expert in the field of brain memory. Hold on for the state. Just a few questions, if I may. Dr. Diamond, have you ever actually testified for the state in a criminal trial? No, I have not testified for the state. And how many times have you testified as an expert? I've testified um, in total over about a, a dozen times. 12, 13? Um, I believe it's 13 times. And has it always been for, in a criminal case, the defendant? It has always been uh, for the defendant. And how many criminal trials? have there been when you've testified? Um, I believe it's um, six, six or seven criminal trials. Uh, if I might, I wanna be clear. So I, I wanna actually, I don't normally count. So it's,
it's actually been 10 trials in which I've testified as an expert in a criminal trial. So that would be about three times you've done expert testimony in a civil setting, is that correct? That's correct, about three or four times. And you mentioned that you had published an online article. What year was that? I would estimate that that was, and I, I could check that is in my CV. Um, we want to be precise. Um, I don't have the exact year, but I think it was around 2016. Before or after you were anticipated to testify in this case? Um, I believe it was uh, before I expected to testify in this case. And you mentioned you had published a paper in a medical slash legal journal. What year was that? That was 2019. So well after your anticipated testimony in this case. That's correct. And I think Mr. Durham had asked you, but I'm not clear. I, I, don't, I don't think I got the answer on this. Are there other doctors who are specialists in this field or are you the only one? Are you asking, are there other scientists who specifically study children forgotten in cars? We'll go ahead and I'll ask that. Are there other scientists who specifically study children who are forgotten in cars? In my experience, I have not seen a single scientist that has made this an area of expertise. So would it be fair to say you don't have any competition in the field of being an expert testimony when a parent who has left their child in a car and it's resulted in that child's death when that goes to trial. I would say that's correct, yes. And how many times have you testified as an expert witness since 2016? Five, five times. And your anticipated testimony today is going to be about memory, the brain, memory systems, and how people basically, I think I said learning, but I think it's basically brain and memory systems. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, no objection for that particular topic, Your Honor. All right, we can uh, proceed to testify in, the, in an expert in the field of memory and the brain. Is that correct, what you're asking for, Mr. Durham? That is correct, Judge. You may do so. Now, um, Dr. Diamond, when you are uh, doing cases like this and reviewing on cases like this, the ones you've testified to in the past, um, the, uh, what kind of information do you use to form your opinions? I interview the person who was charged with the crime to try to understand the circumstances around it. I want to confirm for myself that it actually appears to be a memory failure. I want to determine that there aren't other circumstances that can explain why the child was left in the car, which might be outside my area of expertise, or might give me concern that the child might have been left intentionally. And do you also do you, um, consider other cases you've worked on and other cases that you reviewed? That's correct. So I compare the current case that I'm involved with <clears throat> with the other cases, as well as with the scientific literature. And you, when you're doing this research and you're doing these findings, 
um, are you using your educational, uh, in these specific type cases, are you using your educational background uh, that you have um, received your entire uh, career? That's correct. So I would relate <clears throat> everything that I had learned about the case to my background in neuroscience, to the latest research um, that would be relevant to the case. And then that would help me to develop hypotheses about the case. And when you say research, you're talking about research that other people have done as well as yourself. That's correct. So I would be depending on research out in the field conducted by other scientists. And uh, would they be, uh, we also consider articles and uh, studies, uh, experiments by other scientists. That's correct. And in the field of brain memory, um, other experts in the field of brain memory, do they uh, also use this type of evidence when they're forming their opinions? Um, certainly, the way in which scientists work is that we take into account all of the field of science. We integrate that and then relate that back to our own work and developing our own um, theories. Now, you were, um, working on this case, did you rely on that type of evidence? That's correct. Let's talk about a little bit about your work on this case, if you don't mind. Um, you uh, had conversations, uh, or did you have conversations with um, Max Kilgore? Yes, I did. And was that back in 2014? Um, yes, as I recall, it was 2014, yes, soon after the incident. Uh, you didn't officially get on the case until uh, probably in 2015, is that correct? That sounds right. Okay. And um, so um, did, you, uh, in, did you wind up being retained on the case? Yes, I was. And uh, who were the attorneys you were working with? Oh, um, well, I, I'm Maddox Kilgore was the lead attorney that I worked with. Uh, I don't recall the names. I, I don't recall the names of the other two gentlemen that I worked with. One was Carlos. Okay, uh, but the name Carlos Rodriguez ring a bell? Yes, Carlos Rodriguez. And how about uh, 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 T. Brian Lumpkin? Yes, yes, I recall that. Okay. Now, did um, you all have communications with uh, one or two or all the attorneys, um, any combination in there up throughout uh, your um, being on the case? Yes, I did. And did you um, talk to them about the evidence in the case and review some of the evidence? Yes, I did. Did y'all ever meet face-to-face? Uh, -face? Yes, we met face-to-face -face, um, a few times. Um, one time they came to Tampa to discuss the case with me, and twice I came to Georgia to see them about the case. Okay. And um, did you um, work on the case throughout um, the time that you were retained to uh, prepare for testimony? Yes, I did. And did you present them um, uh, you know, PowerPoints uh, to... Um, as a kind of a guideline of what you were going to testify to and the, the, the um, did you present in PowerPoints? Yes, I did. And would you have testified in this trial had you been called? Yes, I would have. And you were prepared to testify in trial? I was prepared to testify. All right. Now let's go over the um, specifics of the, we'll start with the meetings. I mean, what was the first time y'all met? Do you remember? Um, uh, from my recollection, we met, um, we met in, and I believe I have this down somewhere, in um, August of 2015. Um, yes, August of 2015. Do you know where y'all met? Um, it was, was um, here. well, I met them. I met Maddox and his group in his office and we then went to the prison where Ross Harris was held. 
All right. Um, let's see here. Um, now, when you met with him, uh, when you met with him, um, did you uh, tell me about that first meeting? Had you had? Have you talked to him about the case before then? Yes, I have. Okay. And did you? Um, before before y'all met now when you got here what what happened did uh what, what did y'all do the first meeting we met in a in sort of a conference room at the prison where ross harris um, was held um and we spoke for probably about an hour or two in which i interviewed him about the circumstances in which the child died All right, and when you say you interviewed him, who was there with you when you interviewed him? Uh, it was uh, Ross and um, Maddox and Carlos, and it's ever called, was it TJ or JC? Would that be, would that be an investigator? Yeah, the other, the investigator, JC, I believe his name. Well, now, um, when you, you, you say prison, would that be the adult, Cop County Adult Detention Center you're talking about? Um, I, 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 whatever the name was, I, I don't have that in my records, but I'll take your word for it. That's where okay. we met. All right. Um, and when you, um, now when y'all met, what, uh, was it in a room together or, um, what is it up through glass? How did it, uh, physically work? We were all in one room together without a glass partition. Okay. And, uh, did you have any, um, uh, notes or anything like that. Uh, that what's going on with your screen? Judge, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. Uh, you Mr. You're screen sharing with me and I'm not able to see the witness. I can hear him just fine. Okay, then seen. I'm having a problem with screen sharing myself, Judge. Um, let me yeah. go ahead and uh, stop that and I'll have to work on that later. There's some documents that we have that um, I, I wanted to, uh, did I need to introduce. And um, that was what I was going to get him to identify. And I, uh, I'm having it, it issues with the screen share. So. Let me say this, if the screen sharing is important, I've seen the witness and I'm hearing him just fine. If you're acceptable with the fact that occasionally I won't be able to see him and I can hear him and you can screen share, that's fine with me. I just wanna make sure it's fine with everybody. I'm waiting for Ms. Nathakowski. I think she was like trying to say something. So. And Judge, oddly, I can see everybody in a little box along the side of my screen and the screen share. So I'm fine with being able to see everything. I can see almost everybody. Are you okay with that, Mr. Screen Curran? share would work. I mean, that's, that's going to be a backup plan I need, Judge, if the screen share doesn't work. It, I've, I've been playing with it over the weekend and it was working, but sometimes if the internet gets... Uh, I don't want to say crowded, but uh, sometimes the connection is not as good, and I'm afraid this might be one of those times. Well, go ahead and do it as long as you are aware that I can hear the witness just fine. I'm just not seeing him, and it may be that once we get into it, I'll be able to see him. Well, um, right now, I just want to let you know that while that was going on, my screen share was just spinning, uh, and it wasn't hooked up yet. Okay. So that's, that, that's my concern. Is mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it just says, it says y'all see it being screen share. I can't get my screen up yet. I'm having to do it. Uh, and uh, it's just not working at this time. Um, it, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to catch. So. Why don't you try it again? I'm sorry? Why don't you try it again? I am. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome very much. I'm here to help you, sort of. Okay, that looks good. Well, I know, but it's, it looks, but I don't have it. Um, yeah, well, you know, things happen step by step. It's just, uh, it's, it's supposed to be here now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start over again. Right. Okay. Can you do something to help, Brett, Audrey? Well, always full of good ideas. I'm sorry. Is she asking? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, if she can, if you can, that would be great. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Durham, yes, my staff attorney can probably do it from his computer. You're going to have to be very specific as to what you want him to show. Okay, well, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I, it could be my hands. That would be wonderful. Do you want to try to do that? Yes, we could. Yeah. Okay. Well, Brett's on the, it's Brett Conway, and he's on the Zoom. Okay. Well, just what I may do then to, um, in, uh, is go ahead and introduce all three of those right now with Dr. Diamond. And then that way we can go ahead and get those out of the way because um, and if we can, uh, especially the, the PowerPoint, but the other two uh, we'll be talking about a little bit more with other people. Ms. Jankowski. Yes, Judge, I'm making sure I'm reviewing exactly what D1 is and the state has no objection to D1. It's admitted. D2, the state has reviewed D2, and D2, the state has no objection. It's admitted. And I believe we have two D3s. One is the actual 50 slide PowerPoint presentation, and then the PowerPoint presentation in PDF format, just so it's easier to see. And I've also reviewed that, and I have no objection for it being tendered for the purposes of this hearing. Okay. Is, is the PowerPoint demonstrative, I guess? It is demonstrative, Judge, um, and uh, if I can get it up later, that's great. The, the, one, the main one I'm going to need is, um, I think it's D1, and that is the type that was actually turned over and used by the state. Um, but I can explain those later on when I need those. Okay, I didn't D1 is the one you want my staff attorney to uh, screen share with us? Yeah, yes, we could just now. Very good, okay. And I, but I'll tell you, we, we don't need it right now. Okay. Um, we don't need it right now. Um, but when I, you know, if, if we can, if we can, uh, I can let y'all know when we do need it. All right. Well, let me build a record. Number three, uh, D3 is in evidence, uh, both pieces, one being a um, PowerPoint, the other being a, a PDF of the PowerPoint. They're both in evidence. And then D1 being in evidence, my staff attorney is going to put it up on the screen share when defense requests that to be done. Fair enough? Thank you very much. Let's proceed. Okay. Okay, um, doctor. Uh, now, when we're going over the, um, the first interview, you had um, some notes with you, or did you take any notes at that time? How did that work? I, 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 this? Is this with Mr. Harris? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I couldn't hear what you said. I'm asking Mr. Durham, what interview are you referencing? The one with the first one the, with the, Mr. Harris? The, um, the, the first interview with Ross Harris and the uh, trial counsel. Very good. And um, so uh, now let's go back over that interview. How long do you, was that a lengthy interview? What did y'all do with that interview? Uh, so to, uh, to answer your first question, I brought notes with me to guide the interview. I don't recall writing anything down at the time. The purpose for me was to get a feel for the case, to speak with Ross Harris, um, to also explain, in a sense for me, criteria that I have for participating in a case. Uh, and I would say, estimate we talked for about an hour, maybe maybe longer. All right, and when we talk, when you're doing this interview and the notes that you're talking about that you brought in there, were those handwritten notes or were they typed notes? Those were handwritten notes. Okay. Now, um, let me go back to this, another question. Uh, and this is just, a: did you expect um, the notes or the uh, information that you um, took down in this case to be confidential? Yes, in fact, I asked Maddox Kilgore if it would, uh, all correspondence would be confidential and he said it would be. And so, um, after after y'all met in that initial time, uh, did you talk with Mr. Um, the, the attorneys about the case further? Yes, I talked quite often with the attorneys about the case after that. I think you said in this first case, it was more for you to get a feel of the case to see if you're going to get involved. Is that right? That's correct. 
and you did wind up getting involved in the case. Correct. Now, uh, do you remember did you, uh, talking with them um, in detail about the uh, case on that day? Uh, did y'all do that further or um, did you go back and um, return at a different time? Yeah, as I recall, we went back to his office and spoke more about the case. And uh, that was with everybody there that you talked about before at that uh, meeting? It's likely, but I can't be certain. Yeah. Did you ever have occasion to um, review police reports or uh, videos or other discovery materials? Yes, I reviewed uh, police reports, videos, uh, numerous uh, discovery materials. Now, was that done here in Marietta? Was that done at your office or both? It would have been both. Okay. And um, while you were in Marietta, did you ever have occasion to... Um, drive from uh, Chick-fil-A to uh, the Home Depot headquarters where you were informed of Ross work? Yes, I wanted to actually see the route that he took. So I did drive from Chick-fil-A to work, uh, to the Home Depot work. What time of day did you do that? Oh, it would have been about the middle of the day. Okay. And um, anybody with you? I would like to be precise and I don't have notes telling me exactly who was with me at the time. Uh, I would think I, I was with the uh, investigator. I, was, I, I assume I was with JC and perhaps with Maddox as well. Okay, but you don't remember the appropriate answer, but, but that's your recollection? That's my recollection. Right. Now. That's my recollection. Now, if we can, let's go over, uh, do you know um, when they came to Tampa to meet with you? My recollection is that they came to Tampa before the scheduled first trial, which would have been in Marietta. Okay. I don't um, have the precise date. Okay. All right, and then did, um, you, have, you said you had a second meeting with them here in, um, in Georgia. That's correct. April 30th, 2016, I came back to Georgia to, to fill in the details of what I was missing from my investigation. All right. And did you have occasion at that time to um, meet with Ross Harris? Yes, I did. And um, where was that at? Uh, that was at the prison where he was held. Okay. Now, um, when you uh, met with him that second time, the um, did you um, have anybody with you? Well, I went with Maddox to the prison, but then I went to see Ross Harris by myself. And uh, just now may be a good time to bring up the um, the one, I believe. Can you do so? D1. I hope I'm right. Okay. Now, doctor, um, if you can, uh, do you uh, recognize uh, this document that's in front of us? Yes, this is from the file from my notes that I brought with me to my second meeting. Okay, now the second meeting, you said it's in the cop, you said it's in the facility where he's being held. Um, was it in the same type of room that you met with him with the attorneys? No, uh, I spoke with Ross Harris across a, uh, plas a, pl a plastic divider. So y'all couldn't touch, he couldn't touch the key, uh, he, you know, he couldn't reach over and talk to you. It was through a glass a partition. That's correct. Okay. And um, what did you have with you? I brought my laptop with me. And um, what was on your laptop? The text you're seeing here um, 
most of it was what I had typed in advance to guide my interview of him. Okay. And now you said most of it was uh, prepared before you met with Ross that day? That's correct. How did you prepare it? Based on my conversations with um, Maddox and his team, based on my interview with Ross Harris the first time, based on all that I had seen in discovery and based on questions that I also had. Okay, and the questions you mentioned that you also had, um, I guess those questions you were gonna possibly ask for Ross Harris to I guess some things cleared up, is that right? That's correct. Now the questions you have, were those questions that you've got after talking with the attorneys? Yes. And uh, reviewing the case? That's correct. And the evidence in the case? That's correct. Taking into account all the evidence in the case, I had, uh, I was seeking additional information. Without going into any hearsay issues, but did uh, the attorneys tell you areas that they were uh, interested in or concerned about? Yes, I had conversations with the attorneys, um, both issues they raised and uh, issues that I raised. Okay, so. Uh, these issues or concerns are all reflected and written down on D1 before you went in to see uh, Ross Harris, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, so if I'm understanding this right, uh, let's make sure the court understands it correctly as well, and that's probably more important. Uh, these three typed pages are on your laptop and you, I think you used the word guideline for uh, an interview after meeting with counsel and getting their input and reviewing the evidence. Um, what's this first level criteria? Well, I still wanted to be clear, um, and I have this for every case I'm involved in, as to whether or not I'm appropriate for the case and whether or not I can testify for the case. Okay. So I have criteria that I have for myself to decide First is, is it relevant to my expertise? And second, am I convinced that this was an unintentional memory related uh, failure? And you also have a question about illicit drug use, a question mark. That's correct. All right. And you also had listed, what, what's got listed down there is number four. Number four is organic memory impairment. So. I wanna know if a person has some form of brain damage, which would be dementia. And so does that help to explain why the person forgot the child in the car? Okay. And up above this, you have interview one listed uh, above that um, title of first level criteria. What does that mean? That refers to um, how I had that uh, was sort of, that was important for me to address in the first interview that I had with Ross Harris to make clear that I could look from one through four and uh, go further with the case. And now the second level assessment of uh, memory error circumstances. Um, the, um, <clears throat> this was again, most of this, I think you said was typed, written, typed, written, typed before you got in there. Did, uh, are any of these answers that Ross gave you Uh, yes, I have questions, I have comments, I have answers also that Ross Harris gave me that are a part of the text. Okay, and um, what, uh, and there are other things that are not part of the text, uh, excuse me, that are part of the text that are not what Ross told you. That's correct. We've gone over those, but um, the, um, under the habit and pattern you have, uh, Driving with child is a subset of drives rare or never before. Is that something Ross told you or is that something you came in there with? That looks like it's, it is what I had based already on my prior interview um, and what I had learned in the case. And, and you learned any, and possibly from talking to the, the counsel as well? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. And is that possibly also uh, from talking to counsel as well? Yes, that's correct. And um, the next one is influences on memory. 
again, uh, I'll ask you the front number two dash influence on memory. Is that anything from what Ross Harris told you? Um, actually, that looks like it's specifically there just to remind me to talk to him about these factors, but that's not uh, what he gave to me. And uh, it would that be something that uh, you, you thought yourself was important, but not a response he gave you? Correct. Now you have, uh, following that, you have sleep deprivation, stress, and prior to or during the drive. That's listed in bold and um, italics. Uh, is there any significance to the bold or italics? Uh, when I bold face uh, the text, it's just there to remind me not to forget to talk about that. Okay. So again, that's something that you uh, had going in there and the importance was for you not for you to um, uh, talk about it. But Correct. not that what Ross told you. Correct. Now the next thing down at the uh, underneath that, you have um, something in uh, type, but uh, about sexting or other um, cell conversations during the drive. Now you have uh, a, a response there. Do you know if that's a pr to, from Ross? Or that would have come from Ross. Okay. Now, um, and you have below that issues for the second interview. When you, uh, That's not a response Ross gave you, is it? Well, I wanted to talk to him about Cooper and when I typed in love and joy in his expression, that wasn't something he told me. That was my impression of his behavior while he was talking about Cooper. And, but I mean, but the, the issue, the, the exact phrase issues for the second interview, again, and that's more of an instruction to yourself. These are the things that you thought were important after talking to counsel and after reviewing the case and in preparation for the defense of the case. That's correct, because I had heard um, about all of the things that he had done with Cooper um, and how he, he came across as such a wonderful father. So I wanted to talk to him about Cooper. Okay, and then um, you, you talk about, um, but below that, there's a, there's a phrase, and again, that when you talk about the Braves game and uh, that response, that is, uh, those are things that weren't his responses. Those were your personal observations and things that you were working towards the case uh, yourself, but they were not anything that he relayed to you. Well, I knew in advance that he had gone to the Braves game um, when Cooper was 20 months. Um, I'm talking here about his demeanor. Um, and so he did talk about Cooper he talked about many, many things, one of which was when he went to the Braves game at 20 months, which I knew in advance. Okay. All right. Now we're going down. You have down at the bottom of this page, you have some um, specific time frames uh, listed there. And uh, you have a um, thing where we'll start with a like, poor night's sleep. And then following that, you have some time frames down there. Um, the first line I mentioned, a poor night's sleep, it ends with part of routine, you have a question mark. Again, that is not any statement, is it, that um, he gave you? Uh, is that something that you uh, and the attorneys thought were important and you needed to go with? That, that's correct. I learned from uh, Maddox Kilgore that he had sent emails on the evening before the incident. So the question was, was that a part of his routine? And these specific times and things like that, and this information all came from the attorney. That's correct. Now, um, the, uh, let's go on over the next page. Um, when we're talking about these other items about, uh, did these, uh, did some of these uh, at the very top, uh, the group at the top, um, did those come from the attorneys or from Ross or from both? Uh, the text at the top came from Ross. Okay. Now, um, the, um, the, 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 the time frames and things like that, would they have been, uh, would they have been uh, something you learned beforehand uh, or at the interview or do you even recall? Part of this I knew in advance um, from speaking with um, Maddox Kilgore 
And so part of this would have been confirming the specific times and the routine. So we, and you can, and so this is like a working document for you for the uh, in preparation of your case. That's correct. Now we have things down here about um, um, you have this phrase received message in route may have changed his route may not not totally sure of a plan. Um, is that conversation you have with Ross? Is that a question to yourself? Do you even know? Uh, no, it looks like I, I got that from Ross. Okay. And they, uh, below that, is, is that a note to yourself? Uh, find out original meeting times? That's correct. Okay. And uh, you have it in bold underline. Is that something you thought was important to find out? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm with Maddox that there was a record of an early morning meeting time at, at, uh, at his workplace. All right, and you have other things here uh, regarding um, the Chick-fil-A uh, and uh, uh, these are the same pattern things that you picked up uh, before you got in there and um, had typed in like the statements uh, traffic out of Chick-fil-A. The indented text is what I got from um, Ross. Okay, the intended text you've got from Ross. The other things where you went in there, uh, you had them on here because you thought they were important, but they didn't come from Ross. Okay. You mean where I had bold face some text? Well, I mean, the, the, the two that are uh, not indented, you mentioned the indented came from Ross. The other two, you then, uh, uh, did you have those written down before you met with Ross that day? That would have been in, in advance. All right. And, those were things that you were using to prepare for uh, your meeting with Ross and prepare for the case. That's correct. Now, down here, the next the next sentence is knowledge of how to erase internet history and question mark. Now, um, that's uh, something you had written in before you got with Ross. Is that is that right? That's correct. And the, the, the next phrase down there below that one, more about forgotten baby dog search history. Was that something you learned from counsel and you talked to them about and not in heading in here before you got with the um that's correct. The, it was there in advance. Can I just say that these uh, these next time before we get to the bottom line, excuse me, the one that, the long underline, the next two paragraphs below uh, where you'll talk about the light bulb, more about light bulb and the hypothetical were those things um, prepared also in advance of this? Meeting yes, they were. And were those things um, along the same lines we talked about prepared after talking with counsel and, uh, and, and reviewing the case and the discovery in the case? That's correct. Right. It's going down underneath the um, long underline and talk about the routines and things at Chick-fil-A. Um, now, you, you had talked with the attorneys before that, uh, before meeting here, obviously we've said that a thousand times. Were these uh, entries here part of that? Or are they uh, all solely what you learned from Ross Harris? Um, that looks like I got that from Ross Harris. Okay. And uh, why do you say that? Well, these are uh, a bit more detailed, um, probably than I would have gotten from the, the attorneys. All right. And um, let's go over to the next page. I'm going to talk about um, the text while driving. Is that something you recall speaking to them about the day uh, and or an answer, or is that there uh, before you met with him? And uh, or do you know that uh, would have been entered in response to my question if he had texted while driving? Now let me ask this: Would that have? Uh, would you have? Um, some of these you talked about would have been his answer, but those questions have been already written down there. For example, didn't text while driving? Would that have been written there, and you just asked him to confirm that? Or was that something that you asked him and that you definitely know as a response? Uh, 
my recollection would be that that was a uh, a question that I had asked him, and I I wrote that down in, as his response. All right, and um, the information about uh, the car seats. So that information on the car seat, are you asking about? Well, about did you that? talk to the attorneys about the car seat issues? Yes, I had known in advance that there was a switching going on with the car seats between his and Leanna's car. So I wanted to find out more details about that. And um, also one was a rear facing seat and one wasn't. Was that, did you learn that before you got to meet with Ross Harris? Yes, I did. And um, this last, uh, very last entry down here um, about the uh, when saved, you have a question mark on that in regarding to a time. Is that something for you? Is that something uh, for you to go back and do later on? That's correct. That would have been a question for me. Okay, so and it's something that you thought was important to follow up on. Correct. Okay. Now, also down at the very bottom, this is uh, spaced a little bit differently than everything else, and it's in italics. Um, is, that, is that a note to yourself there? That was just a, a note to myself to check to see whether he parked in the shade or in the sun. And um, that was something, again, that you had thought was important and wanted to check out was, uh, in preparation for uh, your, your helping out of the defense of this case. Correct. Okay. Thank you. If you can, um, Let's go to, um, you mentioned that you had um, prepared uh, to testify in this case, but you weren't called. Were you actually uh, in Brunswick? Yes, I was in the courthouse. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> if you had to testify, let me just uh, make it, use this time if I can to make it proper what you would have testified to. We talked earlier about um, your work with groups and things. Oh, thank you, God, excuse me. Uh, you work with groups and things uh, in regards to um, uh, children, uh, deaths in, in, in cars. Um, and you mentioned kids in cars. Have, have there been any studies that you're aware of about increased deaths on uh, uh, car deaths for children over the last years? in a pattern of that? Well, we have records um, in part from the media, part from the government as to um, deaths from heat stroke uh, in children over the decades. And so what we have from multiple sources is a clear indication that it was extremely rare for children to die of heat stroke in cars in the early 1990s. And what you see is this increase in deaths from heat stroke in the late 1990s and beyond which correlates extremely well with the development of airbags. Uh, and so as a result of the development of airbags in the 1990s, children used to be placed in the front seat. And we also have documented children dying as a result of the deployment of airbags when they're in the front seat. As a result of that, around the late 1990s, parents were told how important it was to place their children in the back seat. And so you see a drop in children dying as a result of the deployment of airbags to zero. But as a result of children being placed in the back seat, you now see a clear association that now we see children being forgotten in cars. And so it's dramatically increased in the incidence, um, which is associated with children now being placed in the back seat of cars. So if I'm understanding this testimony correctly, you know, the uh the issue about the airbags uh, causing uh, deaths or injuries, severe injuries to children uh, because they were in the front seat 
uh, was remedied by uh, rear, the, uh, the, the seats in the back, of moving the child seats into the rear. And that correct. was the remedy, is that correct? That's correct. And then while well, I think we, uh, if I've got this clear, I'll make sure I'm clear on it. The cost of that was uh, now there, uh, once the children went in the back seat, there became a, uh, an increase in children being forgotten in cars. Correct. Okay. Now, um, we've gone uh, earlier uh, and talked a little bit about your um, expertise in memory now. Um, how does memory play into this uh, particular aspect about uh, children being left in cars? So when a parent puts a child in the back seat, they clearly have the plan to take the child to daycare or wherever that location destination is. That requires an active memory process. The parent is driving to some location which may not be the daycare location. And so what it requires for the parent to do is keep in mind that the child is in the car. And so in route to an ultimate destination, which in every case is not the daycare, the ultimate destination is somewhere else. The parent must keep in mind to drop the child off along the route and then continue on to the second location. Can you give me like an everyday example of what you're talking about there? Well, we, keeping memory in mind is something that we kind of all experience how easy it is to forget something. We have something um, called prospective memory. Prospective memory means that you are planning to do something in the future. You can't do it right now. You wanna do it in the future. For example, let's say you have an important phone call that you have to make later this afternoon. You obviously can't make the phone call now you must remember to make that phone call later today. And we know how frail that kind of memory is. And so we give ourselves reminders. We would have our secretary remind us or we would have an alarm go off on our phone because we know if we don't have a reminder, that memory may not get reactivated. And so that's one way to think about it. There are ways in which I've observed and people study how an everyday activity we can forget to do something that we plan. Is that where you would like me to give an example? Sure. So what's very common that people often can relate to um, is that they're on their way home from work. And on this day, they may have received a call from their spouse or they have the intention to stop at the store. And so they're driving the route with every intention to stop at the store. And as they approach the store, they just drive right past it and they end up at home. Um, this is a prime example of prospective memory failing. The, the plan to do something in advance, but when the time is right for that plan to be executed, the memory doesn't get reactivated and the person goes through a routine. All right, so um, in your studies and in, uh, of the brain and how this memory works, are there different um, areas of the brain that kick into play here? Yes, so I think it's important to understand how this works by realizing that the brain is not just one mass of tissue. The brain is made up of different structures that are a bit like the different organs in the body, the liver, for example, having an obviously different function from the heart. So in the brain, we've got different structures and each one has a different function. So when we're talking about planning and memory, we have essentially three structures are really important for our purpose today. We use our frontal cortex to plan the future. So it is our frontal cortex, for example, that says, normally I drive from work to home, but today I wanna to stop at the store along the way. That is our frontal cortex that allows us to do that. We have our prime memory structure, and that is the hippocampus. And that is the structure I've focused on now for over 40 years. That is our memory structure for remembering all the details, the conscious details of our life. And so it is the job of the hippocampus 
to process that information for that day that on today's drive, I want to interrupt it and go to the store. So at the time in which I'm approaching the store, the hippocampus must get activated for you to retrieve that memory. If it is not activated, you will continue along with your route. And so the third structure is called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is an extremely primitive structure that operates at a subconscious level that allows us to do things automatically. It's called the autopilot system. So it's our basal ganglia that as a result of us driving hundreds, maybe even thousands of times from work to home, that takes us directly from work to home pretty much without us having to think about it. We make those moves automatically. And so those are the three structures that are involved in that kind of plan. Let me just see if I can uh, break this down from my simple brain. Um, if you, you have the basal ganglia, which is your habit, uh, something, your routine, and it's, it's fairly powerful, is that right? That's correct. The basal ganglia is a very powerful brain structure. And it, it's basically mostly on habit things that you do routinely. That's correct. Now you, but to change the routine, you come up with a plan and that's done by the um, frontal cortex. The frontal cortex develops the new plan to break that habit. That's correct. The frontal cortex would have the plan to say, change your habit, your routine today to do something different. Now that plan doesn't come into effect though, uh, unless the hippocampus triggers it. That's correct. Okay. And so when it's time to do the act to break the routine, hippocampus has to activate or the basal ganglia will just roll over and you'll go back into the routine. Is that, is that, that that's order? correct. Okay. And I think, the, is it fair to say then the basal ganglia is uh, by far the most dominant? Well, there is a dynamic interaction between the basal ganglia and the hippocampus. The basal ganglia, its job is to get you to do something automatically. The hippocampus has a job for you to remember whatever is new to do today. And these two structures, literally, they compete. with each other. And we know that as you're doing something out of habit, the basal ganglia can actually suppress the hippocampus, which helps us to understand why it is the hippocampus doesn't get activated at just the right time. Now, um, have there been any um, studies or tests or anything done um, um, as far as uh, showing how these interact? So there is a there is a very nice imaging study, which means you have people in a machine in which you're actually looking at their brain activity. And in this study, which was published in Nature about two decades ago, the people were doing something out of habit. They had learned a task. And when you're doing this out of habit, it basically confirmed what we know that the basal ganglia was activated. But even more important was as the basal ganglia was activated, you saw an inhibition reduced activity specifically in the hippocampus. And so that helps us to visualize 
how these brain areas are competing. And that's what these authors concluded, that when one brain area is activated, the basal ganglia, it can inhibit the activity in the hippocampus, making it more difficult then for the hippocampus to do its job. Now, um, this loss of, I mean, I want to use the phrase of the, the hippocampus not being able to do its job or not being able to recall the plan. Is that something that's quick and it happened over, is it, is it a long drawn out process? How, how is it in relation to time? So there is extensive research at studying prospective memory. There are decades. And again, prospective memory means the hippocampus has to be activated in the future to remind you to do something that's a part of your plan. And the studies have looked at how rapidly uh, the hippocampus seems to get suppressed as a result of a person being stressed or distracted. Um, and so there are experimental studies that show as little as 15 seconds of distraction can interfere with someone's memory to do something as little as 40 seconds in advance. Well, um, let's talk about that stu the studies you, uh, you just mentioned. Uh, um, can you give us an example of one of the studies that, um, that, that, talk, that did that, how it worked? So in the study that I'm, I'm thinking about, um, published in the Journal of Applied Psychology, uh, the way they set this up is that people are performing a variety of tasks and the task can take 40 seconds or so. And so they simply do the task. It takes 40 seconds. They move on to the next task. Now, what they're also told is that if they happen to see while they're doing that task, a red screen shows on their monitor, then that's a cue to them that they need to remember that they had seen the red screen. And when they finish that task, which again takes only 40 seconds, they have to remember that they have to press a cue. They have to press a, 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 a key on the keyboard. So this is a test of prospective memory because they are seeing the red screen and they have to hold on to that information until they finish the task 40 seconds later. And that's only when they've seen the red screen do they then hit the key on the keyboard. And normal people doing this remember it about 90% of the time. They do it correctly. <clears throat> the distraction was that, again, in a 40-second task, people would see that red screen, but then afterward, they would be given a distraction, which could last only 15 seconds. That distraction was just to do something else, like do some simple math. And then they'd go back to their task. And now at the end of that 40 seconds, they're supposed to remember to hit the key on the keyboard if the red screen had shown during that time. So the difference being the distraction. Well, what they showed was that about half of the time when people were distracted, they failed to hit the key on the keyboard. That's a failure of prospective memory, which is extremely rapid. And so I guess what you're telling that study shows uh, just a minor distraction on a short project um, can cause 30% 30 to 40% of people to uh, completely uh, forget the plan they had just, just four seconds ago. As I recall, it was almost half of all the people forgot. Right. Is that, uh, other, I mean, is, is that study unique? Are there other, other things to confirm that study? Oh, this is a, a very extensive literature. The prospective memory literature um, goes back decades. Um, and so there have been other studies as well. And in particular, we're looking at um, people in the medical field. They're very concerned um, about people forgetting to perform a task uh, uh, in conditions in which you have healthcare workers. So you have looked at a lot of, there's been a lot of applied research studying prospective memory and how it can fail very rapidly. Okay, well, um, this uh, memory lapse we're talking about with the prospective um, memory, um, 
in, in your experience and in, in, in your work and studies, uh, have you found it, uh, can you tell us how it relates to, to car cases? I'm sorry, was your question, I, I couldn't hear the end. Okay, uh, how it relates to car cases. Oh, kids forgotten in cars. Is that, is that your question? Um, so yes, this is exactly what we're talking about to remember that the child is in the car when there are no other cues, when the child is not making noise, when there isn't a cue in the front seat, like a diaper bag indicating the child's in the car. If there are no other cues that the child is in the car, then it's entirely fits with the literature on prospective memory. The parent places a child in the car seat and then starts to drive. The parent assumes um, that they will remember that the child is in the car if they're going to a different destination. And so that is a case in which what we have with children forgotten in cars is a prime example of failure of prospective memory. Okay. Now, um, in your studies of, um, that you've done um, in this field and with these other cases that we've talked about and uh, that you've researched, are there any common factors uh, that lead, uh, that are consistent um, with uh, child being left in a car? Yes, so in my research, both from studying the cases from the media, from interviewing dozens of the parents that have forgotten children in cars, I find a commonality. First, the most important factor is that the person is, is making a change to a routine. There is always a routine. The person has a plan to modify that routine in some way that involves taking the child out of the car. And in every case, the person goes through the routine that quite often does not include the child. And so getting back to the brain studies, this is a person that is now going through the functioning of the basal ganglia to do a habit. And so what universally is happening is that the person is not interrupting that routine to take the child from the car. Now, um, in our, uh, the, the, the change in routine, is that an important factor? That is a central factor. That is a consistent factor. You see that in each case that there is a routine that the person takes that may or may not include the child. And so there is the habit behavior um, that now has to have the reminder. So the basal ganglia alone will take the person from point A to point B, and that may not include the child. And so what's essential is for the hippocampus to be reactivated to remind the parent that the child is in the car. Now, um, are there any, uh, you, you reviewed our case uh, and you talked uh, in detail about how you did it and things like that. In, this, in, in, in Ross Harris's case, did you find any uh, facts or factors or circumstances that would be consistent with the change in routine that you just talked about? Yes, I have. From my interview with Ross Harris, as well as other information that I gathered, I saw that he had um, a routine. His routine was, and it's pretty much every day, that he would get up with Cooper, um, have breakfast with Cooper. He would then prepare him for the day. He would then leave home, take Cooper to daycare. Um, he would often then go to the Chick-fil-A. He went to Chick-fil-A probably four or five days a week. Um, go Typically go through the drive-through, pick up his breakfast and then go to work. That was his typical routine. Did you, uh, did you come up with the other routines that he, sometimes he did, uh, other variances of that? So there were other uh, routines. Rarely, Cooper wasn't with him. So he also had the routine in which he would drive straight from home. He would stop at Chick-fil-A for breakfast, typically going through the drive-through, um, and then go straight to work. Um, 
it was relatively rare that he didn't go to Chick-fil-A, but the other typical routine was that he would drive from home, take Cooper to daycare, and if he wasn't going to Chick-fil-A, he would then drive straight to work. Those three are really his primary routines that had gone on for months to years. What about, as you mentioned, the change in routine uh, that would have to be consistent with what you talked about? Is there anything in, in this case that was consistent as far as the change in routine? So what we had on the, the morning of the, the incident was a change in routine. So on that morning, what I had learned was that Ross Harris was running late. Um, he didn't follow through his typical routine that morning. He, he always shaved every morning. That morning he, did, he didn't shave because he was in a big hurry because he needed to attend an early morning meeting at Home Depot. So he had planned on his routine to when he was leaving home, he was going to drop off Cooper at daycare and then perhaps go to Chick-fil-A or straight to, to work. Um, but actually, since he didn't have breakfast, he would have gone from home to daycare, pick up the breakfast at Chick-fil-A, and then go directly to work. So he had planned on doing his typical routine. Now, along the drive, he received a message. And that was between home and arriving at daycare. The message he received indicated that the early morning meeting had been delayed. So he didn't need to hurry to attend to get to work. And so what I learned from my interview with uh, Ross Harris was that since he was no longer in a hurry, he decided to go to Chick-fil-A and have a sit down breakfast with Cooper. Now this is something completely out of the ordinary. He had almost never done this in Cooper's life. And so he has now changed his routine. His plan now is to go to breakfast with Cooper and then after leaving Chick-fil-A to have an entirely different approach, an entirely different route from normal, which was he would leave Chick-fil-A, take Cooper to daycare, and then from daycare, he would go to work. This was an extraordinarily rare routine, um, one which was not at all a part of his typical routine. Now, let me just, you, you talked about what you've learned, uh, and you, you said, uh, I think I wanna make sure I'm clear that um, a lot of this came from your interviews with Ross Harris. That's correct. Did you also uh, learn it from uh, and, and get other information in regards just to help you form your opinion about it being consistent? Yes, I also learned this from um, uh, Maddox Kilgore as well, as far as his routine. And, um, okay, all right, let's go ahead and go forward. So uh, you, uh, there were consistencies uh, in that you have determined uh, in Ross Harris's case and in, in other, other cases that you've dealt with. That is correct. In, in regards to factor one, and that would exactly, be yes. uh, the change in plan. What, are there any other factors? So that is the central factor is making a change to the typical routine. Now, again, we're focusing on hippocampus because its job is to remind the person that you're now doing something out of the ordinary. The hippocampus is one of the most vulnerable parts of the brain to stress, to distraction. When we're looking at why do people forget to make the phone call later? Why do people forget to hit that key in that, in that study? The absolute reason why they forget is because the hippocampus is vulnerable to distraction. And so it doesn't get activated on time. So that is one factor is whether we're talking about stress or a strong distraction, um, diverting our attention, that completely interferes, that can interfere with hippocampal functioning. A second factor is that we know that the primary area that is impaired by sleep deprivation, by a poor night's sleep, 
is that the campus. And so, Dad, from, just let me stop you real quick, Dr. Before we get to uh, the sleep deprivation, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the stress or, um, or the distraction itself so that, before we move on to sleep deprivation. Now, um, were there things, um, you know, that through your research of our case um, and uh, your findings in our case, were there factors that would be consistent uh, with Ross Harris? with the similar cases that uh, deal with uh, the factor you've talked about, a stress or distraction? Yes. So there are some factors. We know that chronic stress can interfere in general to reduce hippocampal functioning, and there are more immediate factors that reduce hippocampal functioning. So chronic factors that are involved, specifically with Ross Harris, um, was that this was a stressful time for him he was the primary involved in a major project um, for Home Depot's website. Um, and so this is a, a chronic stressor for him that he was dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, and so that was um, one factor. He was rather stressed that morning about that early morning meeting. The job was not yet completed. It was running over time. And so he has on his mind, um, these uh, stressful influences in in his life. Okay. Now we also have an immediate distraction as well. Would you like me to talk about that? Uh, please, I want to talk about every anything consistent in this case. Yes. Okay. So, um, in general, what I have found in cases is that something goes on during the drive that can be a powerful distractor. And that contributes to why it is um, people forget to do something out of habit. So in this case, exiting from the Chick-fil-A is not very easy. Um, it's very challenging. And so when one exits from the, the Chick-fil-A, to be able to make the left, ultimately left turn to go to the Home Depot office, what one needs to do is go across the traffic and make a very difficult U-turn in which there is ongoing traffic coming from the opposite side. And on top of that, coming out of the Home Depot parking lot, there are trucks that come from underneath and they come up into the street. And so it is a very difficult U-turn to make coming out of the, the Chick-fil-A and it requires total attention to being sure that it's done safely. Um, that would be very consistent with my research that something along the drive is a powerful distractor and stressor that then takes precedence for the person's attention and draws attention away from the hippocampus, reminding the person to do the change in routine. Now, you had mentioned a, a while back in the testimony, um, have you done that drive? Yes, I have actually done that drive. So you know that you turn that the, the people have been familiar who will talk to you about the case they're, they're referring to. I know that it's not an easy U-turn. Okay. And uh, now um, let's go on ahead and go to um, um, the sleep deprivation that you were you go in there and I kind of rudely interrupt you. I apologize. Could you go back to that? I'm sorry. I was just looking at my notes. May I elaborate on that U-turn? Sure. Um, apparently that is a, such a hazardous U-turn that it is now illegal to make that U-turn. And so at the time it was not illegal, but apparently according to my notes, it's, it's, it's actually so hazardous, it's, it's an illegal U-turn now. Okay, all right, thank you. And do you know where that information came from? Uh, I may have gotten that from Maddox, Maddox Kilgore. And um, all right, so if we can go ahead and go forward with the, um, Sleep deprivation. Um, so factor. sleep deprivation is a factor. It's well established that if you have a poor night's sleep, um, that targets the hippocampus. Um, this is why we become much more forgetful um, if we've had a very poor night's sleep. Um, and it contrasts that with the basal ganglia. For example, no matter how bad your night's sleep is, you're not gonna forget how to get to work if you've gone a thousand times you've driven to work. 
but you are much more likely then to forget um, any items that day because your hippocampus is not functioning optimally. So in the evening before the incident, um, what you have is Ross Harris is involved in multiple activities that evening. Um, and first of all, to preface that, in my interview, I learned from him that he typically uh, would go to bed at about midnight and he'd be up at about 7 a.m. And so he would typically have seven hours of sleep. The night before this happened, um, he was up, he was working on this project. He was emailing to others about the project. Um, he was also in the process of applying for a passport for Cooper. And this is well after midnight. So if we put all this together, it appears he did not um, get to bed um, before 1, 1 a.m. What we also, what I also have gathered is Cooper got up early that morning and Ross took care of Cooper in the mornings. So Cooper woke at five in the morning and then Ross had primary care for him at the time. So we're looking at an evening in which Normally he would have about um, seven hours of sleep. So on this evening, um, we're looking at only about four hours of sleep. So that would contribute to reduce functioning of the hippocampus. Now, yeah. and um, just to be clear, um, your review of the case, and uh, did you also um, review Ross's interview with the police? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, so some of the information you got uh, came from that as well? Yes, that's correct. The uh, information or the, the facts you just listed out is in, in regards to uh, the night before with Ross and, and the waking up early in the morning and things, would those be the type of uh, items that would be consistent with uh, memory failure in the cases that you've worked on in the past in your expertise? Yes, that's correct. I think we've gone through three factors. How many factors are there that you found? Well, the final factor is sort of is crucial that distinguishes cases in which parents have forgotten children in cars and the children die from those in which the children don't die, in which they're not ultimately not forgotten. Because I have interviewed dozens of parents and people have contacted me to say that they had forgotten their children were in the car, but then there was a cue. Something reactivated their memory that there is a child in the car. Often it's the child makes a sound and the parent is alerted to the child being in the car. Or there is something on the front seat that is there only when the child brings, the parent brings the child to daycare or there's something in the back seat that the person um, the person goes into the back seat to retrieve some item and then discovers that the child is there. So ultimately the presence of a cue is critical because it's the cue that reactivates the memory specifically that the child is in the car on that route. And in the current case, there was no cue that react that would have said, would have reactivated Ross Harris's memory that Cooper was in the car. So um, would your testimony be that uh, the factors you've seen in our present case are consistent with the absolute cue that has been uh, apparent in um, case, the fatal cases where uh, that you've researched, that is consistent with those? That's correct. In every case in which a child died, there was no evidence of there being a sound from the, from the child or any other cue that would reactivate the memory that the child was in the car. Let's talk about the cue for a second. I, if I've got this right, what the cue does is it reboots the hippocampus. That's correct. It would, in a sense, reboot the hippocampus, but it's specific for the memory of the child being in the car. So it's not just anybody talking about the child or a picture of the child. For example, you go to work and you look at a picture of the child, that's not a cue that would reactivate the memory that the child is in the car. It must be something specific to the child in the car. Well, an example that I've heard of in the past, which I think uh, was uh, 
Um, if you uh, put like a, a, your own shoe in, in the back seat with the beside the child seat um, and you get out and start walking, you wouldn't realize you have one shoe on. Would that be a, a, a decent cue in a case like this? Well, I have to tell you, even though it sounds amusing, um, there are people who advocate that when you put your child in the car seat, that you do that, that you put a shoe or that you put your cell phone, you put something in the back seat that you will need to retrieve on exiting the car. Um, and there's a very strong movement to do something like that. Yes. And so you step out of the car, you have only one shoe on, you will then reactivate the memory that says, oh, I put that shoe in with my child in the back seat. Now, you had talked a while back about when you first took the stand about um, some legislation that uh, um, you had talked with uh, um, some government officials about. Is, would that legislation be in reference to having cues in the car, put in, 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 in uh, the technology in the car? Yes, that would be about technology. And so the technology has actually been around for a decade or more. And so it's a very simple form of technology. It's actually already present um, in cars. In fact, uh, 2016, that technology was already standard in um, some GM cars. And so this is simply a system that detects that an individual is in the car, whether it is a child or a dog. Dogs have been forgotten in cars and they have died of heat stroke as well. So this is, this is a form of technology that would be automatically activated to give a reminder to the person that someone is moving in the car. Well, you know, you've also testified a little bit, um, well, you just testified actually about uh, a picture or talking about the child may not necessarily be a cue that the child is in the car at that moment and that you had just forgotten to uh, complete your task. Um, why is that? So it's very important and difficult for people to understand how it is someone can spend a day at work and even talk about their child, look at pictures of their child and even plan on picking up the child at, at daycare but meanwhile, the child is in the car. Um, so we need to understand about how there are different levels of memory. Looking at a picture of your child is simply a reminder that you have a child, but it doesn't provide you with any specific information about the child still being in the car. And in fact, what we have are decades of research on what's called false memory. False memory research is based on the idea that if we assume something has happened, it actually becomes a false memory that we actually think it, it did happen. Um, and so what I hypothesized in my publication is that when the parent exits the car, having lost awareness that the child is in the car, the brain has now created a false memory. That false memory says that the child must be at the, the appropriate location. And so the parent goes into work being absolutely certain that the child is at, in this case, daycare. And so the parent brings that false memory with him to work. And so in fact, you have many cases that are such tragedies in which you have parents going back to the daycare, looking to pick up their children, absolutely certain that the child must be at the daycare only, only to be told by the daycare provider that the child never arrived. And they're completely bewildered because they have no idea where their child is. And they Maybe. then discover their child has been in the car all day. Then, uh, through your research or um, work experience, have you dealt with cases specifically like that uh, where um, maybe a cue was coming in the, in the uh, the uh, parent didn't realize, didn't recognize it as a cue that somebody's in the car. Well, the cue can be indirect. I am aware of a case in Tennessee in which a child was forgotten in a car in a parking lot. 
and the father had an office overlooking the parking lot where he could see his car. And in this case, the car had a motion sensor and that motion sensor would be activated uh, remotely. So in this case, the father was able to look out on the car at the parking lot and remotely shut off the alarm because there was no evidence that anyone was trying to break into his car. And that was the only reason he could think that the motion sensor was going off on the car. He had no conception that it was possible that his child was in the car causing that motion sensor to go off because he had that powerful false memory that told him that he had dropped off his child to daycare that morning. And uh, in reviewing um, the, uh, the factors that you've just gone over and um, the uh, information that you uh, have developed in, in this particular case, um, are those factors consistent with uh, your experience and expertise uh, in cases that uh, involve when a, a child's accidentally left in a car? Are, are those factors consistent with that? Yes, all, all those factors are consistent um, with, with this case. How fast, Dr. Diamond, how fast or how slow, I mean, uh, does it take, well, what's the time frame to take a, uh, to lose, to lose that, um, that awareness? Um, well, I have a, an example from real life that I could share with you that actually happens quite often. So in my research, I study media reports of tragic memory errors. And it's actually far more common than one would believe in which police officers and detectives leave their loaded guns in bathrooms. Your Honor, at this point, I'm gonna object. No objection. Relevancy, hearsay. He just testified he studies media reports. So this is not personal knowledge. He hasn't interviewed anybody. And we're talking about other people who have done other things where they've forgotten something. It's not relevant to the issues here. Mr. Dorn, your argument? Uh, Judge, I believe it is relevant because these are things that he does uh, to form his opinion. And he does this research and media reports, reading articles is part of it. But uh, more directly, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this case he's about to talk to us about, if he's allowed to, he actually <laughs> did speak with somebody. He spoke with the officer who did it as part of his research and part of his uh, uh, expertise trying, trying to determine what, how this brain works. And he, he actually interviewed the man and uh, got more details and did speak with him. If this is the case, I'm referring to, I think. Well, I think you need to develop a better foundation. I do find the relevancy to be, be a bit all right. Um, the case that you're talking about, Dr. Diamond, the, I'm sorry. Mr. Durham, I'm, I'm talking. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to allow you to proceed to lay a better foundation. I think the relevancy may be questionable, but I'm going to let the witness testify for purposes of the record only. I think I've understood you, Judge. And I'll keep it. So if I don't do what you said, it is not that I'm ignoring your order, but I'm trying to follow it the best I can. Oh, I know. Um, I know that, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Diamond, uh, before you get into what uh, your findings on that, the, the, um, you, um, do you do, do you read articles in, in, in part of your work? Yes, I, I will read media reports as a part of my research to see the phenomenon of how memory failures can be catastrophic. Okay. And in this particular case you're about to talk about, did you do anything other than read the media report? Yes, I, in addition to reading the media report, I was able to locate the detective that uh, forgot his gun in a bathroom. And so I was curious, based on my research, as to understand how it is possible that an officer can leave a gun in a bathroom. And was it, um, did you talk to him about the circumstances of what, uh, and how long of a time delay it was and how, uh, what caused him possibly to lose that awareness of what he was doing. 
Yes, I did. I interviewed the detective extensively to understand the circumstances around why it was he left the gun in the bathroom. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to tell us, uh, Dan, a little bit about the circumstances, what you had learned from this detective and part of your research. So in the news report that I read, it was that a gun had been left um, in the bathroom of a movie theater in Tampa. The gun was in fact placed on the toilet roll dispenser immediately in front, and this is from the news report, immediately in front of the officer sitting on the toilet. And so I asked him specifically about that. How is it possible for you to leave a gun that frankly is in full view of you? Um, and I shared with him how kids forgotten in cars, these children are behind the driver. This gun was right in front of you. And so he shared with me that he was at the movie theater with his son and he was using the bathroom. He had placed the gun on the um, toilet roll dispenser. And just as he was finishing, his son came into the bathroom and yelled, hurry dad, the movie is about to start. And in that moment, he turned and hurried out, finished putting his clothes on, left the stall, and in that split second, he lost awareness that his gun was on the toilet roll dispenser and then went to watch the movie with his son. Did, uh, did you learn of any cues that he might have had later on about the uh, gun? Yes, an additional discussion I had with the officer, he said that while he was watching the movie, there was an altercation in the theater between two men. And he had some concern that he may have to get involved. And as he reached for his gun, he realized that it wasn't there. And then in that moment, and when we're talking about the brain, that would have activated his hippocampus to remind him that the gun is in the bathroom. So he hurried off, went to find his gun that he had left in the bathroom. And uh, we're quite fortunate that a child had actually found that gun and had given the gun to his father who gave it to the manager. Uh, so there was no tragedy in this case, but it was potentially catastrophic. The, um, the, the, you mentioned the, possibly the thing that caused the father to lose awareness of the, the, the pistol on the um, toilet roll dispenser it was with the son coming in and uh, telling him to hurry, hurry, hurry. Is that uh, one of the factors you talked about? Would that fit into one of the factors you've, you've talked about before? Yes, that is a factor that I've talked about that's well established that even a brief distraction can interfere with, again, what we call prospective memory, the plan to do something in the future. So a brief distraction can cause someone to lose awareness of the plan to do something. And instead yeah. you go through your typical habit. And that, that kind of ties in with the studies that you had done before, I guess, or not that you had done, but you had read about and talked about earlier where uh, you had the 40 second task and uh, a, a, a quick distraction. Is that in line? Exactly. With that? The laboratory work is very consistent with the idea that a relatively brief distractor can interfere with someone's memory to do something in the future. All right, thank you, doctor. Now, Judge, um, Hang on one second, please. Yes. Judge, I think that would probably uh, be my first what his testimony would have been at trial. And so, I, but, but I'm not done. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, there's a couple of other things that I just want to talk about, and that, that is more in dealing with a, a, the other enumerations or just in, in preparation for the motion for new trial. And uh, so, there's, uh, so if I can, just I want to ask the doctor a few more questions. Um, Dr. Dinah, did you um, during your work on the case? Did you um, develop a PowerPoint or points uh, PowerPoints to um, uh, provide counsel as an outline of your testimony? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, um, initially, you, you provided one, and it was a. Uh, I guess a, a 20, it was a shorter slide, about half or maybe less than half of what 
Uh, we've talked about what I showed you yesterday. Um, it's just an admitted D3. Uh, do you remember right. looking at D3 with me yesterday? Yes, I did have an initial uh, brief PowerPoint. And um, did that before you had the meetings with Ross Harris? Well, I know that that must have been before the second meeting with Ross Harris. It may have been before the first. All right, so it was, it was before the second meeting with Ross Harris. And the second meeting with Ross Harris was one where you got uh, you got a lot of the information um, uh, or you talked to him more about the case, more details about the case, I should say. Correct. Right, and that was after you had met with counsel and things like this and talked about the strategy of this case. Correct. Uh, all right. Um, so the um, the power the, the PowerPoint that you um, provided during trial uh, on D three. Now, did you talk about some of the things that we discussed today? Yes, that's in my PowerPoint. And some of the things we've talked about today, there's slides in that PowerPoint as well. Is that fair? Correct. Correct. Um, and we went over specifically last night, instead of just having to go through the PowerPoint and, and uh, put them up now, I just want to go ahead and ask you, do you remember going through slides 22 through 30 uh, with me? Yes, I do. Okay. And um, it just leads a little bit here. The two, the, those cases, that, uh, that was information you talked about, about going through the factors. Uh, Correct. All right. And the diagrams and things that you had in, in that regard were of train tracks and, uh, and the, the route and the routines that Ross took on a normal day and on that day. Correct. Okay. And the reason I'm bringing these up, I just want to, um, those were things that you based your opinion on. And a lot of that came from either things that Ross gave you or that you, um, um, learned during through the attorneys or discovery, but it was things that you used to base your opinion on, including what Ross told you in the, in the jail. Yes, it was a combination of what I had learned in advance and what Ross had told me. And then there's another one is uh, specifically, I think it was uh, number 29, and that is a graph or diagram of Ross Harris's morning driving routes. And it, that, that falls in the same line we just talked about, does it not? Um, so I don't have, I don't have specifically 29. All right, well, 20, you had mentioned uh, the routes, uh, his most common and least common routes. Ah, okay, I have that, yes. And, yeah, you, and you did the graph on that. And that was uh, done, uh, how did that get accomplished? That's accomplished both from information I had in advance and from my interview with Ross Harris. And that was prepared and provided uh, to trial counsel uh, before your testimony? Yes. Okay. And was the building up the um, PowerPoints, was that like a work in progress? Did you get more information, you'd add things, and uh, is that how it worked? Yes, it's clearly a work in progress. It, it develops over time. And um, Judge, I think I am done, but I just do want to make sure that D1, 2, and 3 have been admitted. They have been. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. Thank you. Dr. Diamond, Ms. Janikowski. Thank you, Judge. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. So, Dr. Diamond, your anticipated testimony at trial, that's what I want to talk about right now. So you are going to talk about cues and how cues affect memory. Is that correct? Correct. You are going to talk about fatigue and sleep depri deprivation. Is that correct? Correct. You are going to talk about distractions. Correct. You were gonna talk about stress as a factor, is that right? Correct. And you were gonna talk about routine and when typical routines are interrupted, is that correct? Correct. You were also then gonna talk about prospective memory and how the brain functions, is that correct? 
Correct. Okay. And I want to talk about kind of your methodology. You talk about looking at media reports. Um, would this be newspaper articles like you did with the guy with the gun? Correct. Okay, and you understand that that's a reporter who is putting something out in the media in order to make money, not a police report and or an interview, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And you know what hearsay is, correct? Correct. Okay, so do you normally base a scientific opinion on a series of newspaper articles written by reporters? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, I was baffled as to, in the case of the police officers leaving guns in bathrooms, that makes no sense to me. So I, I read about this happening repeatedly, um, but I didn't understand how it could happen. That was why I sought out one of the, uh, one person who was reported in the media. In fact, it was a local detective. And that was why I had to interview him to understand how it was possible he could forget his gun in the bathroom. And so when you say you also look at other literature in the field, you previously testified there are no other scientists doing what you're doing. So the other literature in the field, is that mostly about other types of memory than say people leaving children in cars? Well, it would come under the umbrella of a failure of prospective memory. So other scientists have actually commented on children being forgotten in cars as a part of a failure of prospective memory. Uh, and so I'm the only one specifically writing about that phenomenon, but it's, functional, it's functionally no different from the other memory failures in which people forget to do something in the future that they plan. So you're testifying that leaving a small child a member of your family, someone you love, who's the most important thing on the planet, in a car is the same thing as forgetting to go to the store. Of course, forgetting a child is in a car, it can't be compared to forgetting to go to a store. But it is a category of memory that is consistent under both conditions. The failure to remember the child the failure to go to the store involves a loss of awareness of a plan to do something in the future. Now, I happen to talk about forgetting to go to a store as one example that most people can relate to, but this kind of memory failure has been catastrophic under other conditions. For example, when airline pilots go through their preparation to take off, they now must go through a checklist. They cannot depend on memory because we know that in the past, planes have crashed because pilots use their memory to go through the checklist. And that was a prospective memory failure, for example, a flight that crashed in 1987. We know it was the same kind of memory failure that happens when children are forgotten in cars or we forget to stop at the store. But in this particular case, or in any case where a parent has forgotten their child in the car, if they did it on purpose, intentionally, then none of this testimony about prospective memory has any relevancy to the case at all, correct? Well, that is why, in fact, a criterion of mine is to determine if the findings in the case are consistent with it being a memory failure. All right, so let's talk about that. You originally started to talk with Maddox Kilgore, uh, Mr. Harris's attorney, back in 2014. Is that correct? Oh, uh, that sounds correct, yes. All right. And was that before or after you made commentary about Mr. Harris's case to headline news a few days after the homicide? Uh, I think that was after I had been invited to write that uh, op ed. Okay, so you remember writing the op-ed June 30th of 2014, is that correct? Uh, that would have been, um, actually the date I have is July, 3rd, July 12th, 2014. 
All right, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. So maybe there was printed later. All right, can everyone see my screen? So far. Dr. Diamond, can you see my screen? I, I see it, yes. All right, so I want you to go ahead and take a look at this for me. Um, right here by Dr. David Diamond, special to headline news updated at 4.49 p.m. on Monday, June 30th, 2014. Does that seem accurate here in stage exhibit number six? Okay, I'll, I will go with that. And do you know that this is actually still readily available on the internet? Okay. All right. And so at this time, Dr. Diamond, you did write this op-ed for headline news, is that correct? Yes. I'll tender states exhibit S6 into evidence. Any objection? Uh, I don't know if I'm muted or not. I have no, there's no objection. Admitted. Thank you. So. There we go. So did you meet with Maddox Kilgore before June 30th or after June 30th of 2014? It would have been after June 30th. And when did you first come to Atlanta for the first meeting where you interviewed Mr. Harris at the Cobb County Detention Center? The first meeting was August 10th of 2015. And you prepared a 22 slide initial presentation, is that correct? Oh, I don't know. I certainly, I didn't present that presentation to them on that day. I presented a PowerPoint in advance. I don't have the specific date of that PowerPoint. Well, let me ask a better question. Prior to April 6th of 2016, when it was served upon the state, did you go ahead and provide the defense with a 22 slide PowerPoint that was intended to be used at trial? I don't recall. All right, I'm gonna have you take a look at State's Exhibit 3. And this is in PDF format, just so we can go through it quickly. Take a look at this. Are you able to recognize this? Yes. All right. And does this look like it's a fair representation of what was served or you provided um, that was then provided to the state? Yes. All right. At this time, the state would tender into evidence states exhibit three, both in PowerPoint format and in PDF format. Any objection? Uh, yeah, no objection. Admitted. Now, after, well, actually on April 6, 2016, directing your attention specifically to that date, do you recall speaking with Assistant District Attorney Chuck Boring? Yes. All right. And you, did you indicate to him that you had previously interviewed Mr. Harris and that that was part of the basis for your opinion. Well, I, I don't recall the conversation, so I, I can't be certain of anything I said to him. All right. Do you recall telling him that you had made written notes of your interview with Ross Harris? I, I have no specific memory of, I know I talked to him, I don't remember specific details. Okay. When you interviewed Mr. Harris on August 10th of 2015, did you actually take written notes? Uh, apparently not. So you met with Mr. Harris for one to two hours, along with Mr. Kilgore, Mr. Rodriguez, and an investigator in anticipation of becoming an expert for Mr. Harris, and you didn't take any handwritten notes. That's correct. In fact, um, afterward, Maddox was said he was surprised that I didn't take notes. Okay. So 
So when we're looking at defendant's exhibit two, what exactly are we looking at here then? So we're looking at what I prepared in advance. In advance of what? Uh, in advance of, of meeting with him. In advance of meeting with Ross Harris. Correct. And so these are these are notes. See, I wanted to give myself reminders that I wanted to be sure to cover uh, to cover. Um, and so what I did was write out a few pages of notes to specifically ask him. And I basically this was as I anticipated would not be the final time I would interview him. This was a way for me just to learn about the case. Okay, I'm, I, so I'm confused. These are notes that you wrote down with your own hand prior to interviewing Ross Harris on August 10th of 2015. That's correct. Okay. And these notes are based upon what? These notes would be based on um, the kind of issues that are related to children being forgotten in cars. What happened in the, his incident that would be consistent or inconsistent with other cases in which children were forgotten in cars, as well as my understanding of the brain and memory. And so where you have things like return to car at lunch where did you obtain that particular piece of information if you had not interviewed Mr. Harris at this point? Oh, that was, uh, that was in the media that he had returned to the car or I had learned that from Maddox that he had returned to his car. So I knew no. all of this in advance. Okay, so when you say you learned, um, I wanna kind of get specific with you. When you say you learned something, was that because you had actually read it in a police report, heard it from the lips of Ross Harris in the video interview or did you get this specifically from the mouths of the defense attorneys who are representing Mr. Harris? Well, as I recall, this actually was an issue that was raised at the original hearing um, in which the detectives talked about a video in which he returned to his car with light bulbs. And are you talking about the preliminary hearing? The preliminary hearing. Did you watch the preliminary hearing? Yes, I did. So these are notes that you're taking in anticipation of asking Mr. Harris about these things like sexting. Correct. I think that says daily routine. Uh, no, during the drive. During the drive. And so this is just a reminder for yourself. That's correct. Okay. And this is based on things like the preliminary hearing and talking to the defense attorneys. And what was in the media. Okay. So when we go back and we look at defendants exhibit one, And Defendant's Exhibit 1 is dated April 30th, 2016, correct? Correct. This was developed based on Defendant's Exhibit 2, your handwritten notes? Right. In a sense, I, I simply um, transposed my handwritten notes into um, the second interview. Okay. And so the second interview actually, you said, took place on April 30th, 2016, correct? Correct. Okay. So I notice on here, there is absolutely no handwriting by you. Is that correct? Correct. So during your interview with Ross Harris on April 30th, 2016, did you take handwritten notes? No. So you interviewed Ross Harris twice. You're going to testify on his behalf, but you never wrote down any handwritten notes. Correct. Why not? Well, this time on the second interview, I brought my laptop. So I entered the answers, entered all the text directly into the laptop. And where's that document? That's this document. Okay, this, so this is the interview, the second interview. All right, so I've just given, I'm confused, just go with me. This is a Word document that was on your computer. And as you interviewed Ross Harris, you filled in and typed in his answers on this document. Correct. Okay, so 
while you're interviewing him, he's the one telling you Halloween, long hallway at Home Depot building, that kind of thing? Well, actually, I had seen that in advance. And so I wanted to talk to him about that. So that was there to remind me to talk to him about it. And when you talked to him about it, did you then take additional notes that are not listed on here as to context or additional information he provided? No. Okay. So I really, really hate to do this, but I have to. Can you please tell me in this first level criteria, what things are things that Ross Harris told you that you typed in from your interview? Well, not, that was all done in advance. All right, so we're gonna move down to second level assessment one and two. What are those? Are those things that you typed in that he said to you? I would say the only thing there would be where I typed and didn't remember when I asked him if he was sexting or had any other conversation during the drive. He didn't remember. All right, so then we move down to the line where it says more discussion about relationship with Cooper, love and joy in his expression. Are those the words of Ross Harris? No, that's my impression of his behavior. All right, so I'm gonna take you through demeanor down to normally sleeping at midnight. Which of those statements that are here are the words of Ross Harris that you typed in while interviewing him? The actual words of Ross Harris uh, would have been that it was not normal for him to be up after midnight, that it happened only once in two months, and he was normally asleep at midnight. So these two, the two last lines on page one of Defense Exhibit One. Correct. Now, I, I believe I got in advance that he was working on a passport application and the record indicated 12.48 a.m., so I asked him about that. And because he confirmed it, I didn't write anything down. So when you testified earlier that he was doing a passport application for Cooper, that would have been the words of Ross Harris, as that was not in evidence at trial, correct? Uh, that is what I would have learned in advance, and he confirmed it, yes. I'm going to take you from almost never doing work at home through right here route. Which of these things on the top of page two are the words of Ross Harris? Uh, I would say that was all from him. Then we start in the middle on need to find out original meeting time. That is a message to myself just to check with the original meeting time. Okay, so then when we go from manager to more about light bulb purchase, how much of that was were his, his words? Um, I can't be certain that he told me the manager didn't notice that he didn't shave that morning or that might have come from um, defense counsel. And I asked him about it. All right. And then when we get down to hypothetical. Is that you? That is, that is typed for me in, adv in advance. All right. And then where it says, couldn't answer the question other than to talk techie, would that be the answer of Ross Harris? No, that's my impression. And then we're, in, we're at the bottom of page two, routinely through not an illegal U-turn at the time. Is that you or is that Ross Harris or is that something you learned from Maddox Kilgore? Um, that I would have gotten from, from him. I... Including where he said a total of four to five times with Cooper to Chick-fil-A for breakfast? Correct. And then this line at the top of page three, didn't text while driving. That's the words of Ross Harris? He, yes, he confirmed that he didn't text while he was driving. And then we look at this section here, forward facing car seat through happy if you know it, hooray. Are those the words of Ross Harris? 
Those are the words of Ross Harris, yes. And then public service announcement through Midnight Project Different in the middle of page three. Are those the words of Ross Harris? Those would be his words. All right. And then from video parked in the shade, I think you said that was a reminder for yourself. Correct. Okay. So would it be fair to say that in defendants exhibit D1, everything that's in here is actual factual information that you had gotten from either the defense attorneys or the actual evidence from discovery along with the words of Ross Harris. As well as some of my um, speculation. And would that be your expert speculation? No, that would be on that hypothetical that I asked him about. Gotcha, a hypothetical here in the middle of page two, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Once you typed this up, what happened to this document, this three-page document that's dated April 30th, 2016? I don't understand the question. Did you print it out? Did you make it a part of your file? Did you give it to the defense attorneys? What did you do with this particular document? Oh, um, I would have used it in developing the PowerPoint and in developing a hypothesis as to how Cooper was left in the car. But this would be on my laptop. Okay. And when did you provide this to Maddox Kilgore? When he requested it. And when did he request it? Um, I don't have that date at hand. All right, well, let me ask you this. Would it have been before the trial started or after the trial started? It would have been before the trial. Does September 19th, 2016 sound about right? Um, I would go with that, All right? At any if, point, at if, any, if you want to be precise, I could potentially find the email in which I, I sent it, so we could be certain of the date. That, that, that sounds wonderful. correct. Okay. Well, the other date I have, unfortunately, is September sixth, which is another date of motions hearings that the state and the uh, defense engaged in in regard to this issue. So I'm just curious if it was before September 19th when they actually served it on the state or if it was September 6th during the motions hearing or even prior to that. Oh, would you like me to, to check now? Is it possible for you to check now? Uh, I, could, I could check. Right. What is the date again? Uh, I'm looking at approximately prior to September 19th because that's the date the state received it. So it would have to have been prior to December 9th, September 19th, 2016. Maybe it's a good time for a break. That's fine, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Drum, how are you moving on your time? Okay. I, uh... I'm sorry, Judge. I just couldn't find me on the, on the shared screen. I was, I was omitted. Um, 
time, as far as uh, the question you're asking me on time, I'm not sure I'm following it. Are you ahead of schedule, behind schedule, on schedule? Um, we have three days, Judge, and I, this time I do not see us uh, taking three days. I, I, mm -hmm. expect we'll be, uh, I think we're about ahead of schedule, I guess, is what your answer is. Oh, thank you. I think Dr. Diamond is speaking. I'm sorry? Did you find the item? I'm closing in on it. <laughs> um, well, we're going to break, so you have more time to close in on it. Let's break till 1 o'clock. Okay. Everyone have a good lunch. We're in recess. At one o'clock. Thank yes. you, Judge. One o'clock, y'all. One, not one thirty. One. One. Okay. Everybody have a good lunch. Thank you, Judge. <laughs>
Oh, no, we can stay there. That's fine. Thank you.
Oh, let me know when y'all are ready. And Your Honor, I think Mr. Lumpkin, Mr. Rodriguez, well, Mr. Kilgore and Mr. Lumpkin are present. They are. I think we've got everybody to go forward. Am I wrong? Who are we missing? Can you resume your cross-examination? Yes, Judge, and I'd like to go ahead and make sure we're rule of sequestration once again. Okay, Audrey's gonna take care of that. Great. Ms. Hastings is going to take, Mrs. Hastings is going to take care of that. Are they sequestered, Audrey? Um, you think so? Yes, I don't think we have Mr. Rodriguez back yet. And I'm not sure who TBL client is. Is that uh, Brian Lumpkin client? No, I don't know. I don't know. Do you have any idea? And then when they bang on the door, we'll figure it out. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we've got everyone sequestered and off. So I will resume. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Diamond, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Were you able to find the email uh, that we were talking about from Maddox Kilgore asking you for your notes, those that were in uh, defense exhibit number one? Oh, I was looking for the email in which I sent the notes. Correct. And I couldn't, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't find it. Okay. Well, thank you for trying to look for that. Um, so I want to go back a minute and make sure I've covered this. In your initial first meeting with Mr. Harris at the Cobb County Jail on August 10th of 2015, did you record that, like audio or video record that interview in any way? No, we didn't. Did you memorialize it in any way, like type it on a laptop or do something else like that? No. Okay. And so you didn't do any handwritten notes, no typed up notes, no nothing like that? No. Okay. Um, now, moving forward into April 
of 2016. At any point in time, did Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Lumpkin, or Mr. Kilgore, and I'll just refer to them as the defense attorneys, tell you that the state had requested um, or was demanding any written notes that you had as to what Mr. Harris had said to you during the interview that you had in August of 2015? Uh, yes, at some point they had uh, requested that I turn over my notes, yes. Okay, so about when was that? Was that closer to trial or was that more in the time of April of 2016? Uh, well, April was when I had that second interview. It was April 30th, so it would not have been before that interview. It would have been after that interview. So after. So at no point in time did Maddox Kilgore or anyone else tell you prior to the interview on April 30th, 2016, that the state was seeking, because you were the expert and you'd been provided as an expert to the state, your notes with about your interview with Mr. Harris and what Mr. Harris said. That's correct. And you said Mr. Kilgore went with you April 30th, 2016 to the Cobb County Detention Center. Correct. But he did not go with you to the interview when you took your laptop and were across the glass partition from Mr. Harris, is that right? That's right. And the 50 slide PowerPoint, the one that you prepared to testify from at trial, a lot of what was in it included statements um, that Mr. Harris had made to you, is that correct? That's correct. Right, and a lot of those statements were actually in defendant's exhibit number one. I mean, you took those notes and then they got translated into your PowerPoint that you were gonna testify about, right? So by exhibit one, do you mean from the first interview? The first interview. Yeah, the one which were all notes on my part, or are you talking about the second interview? which was typed. Now I'm confused again. I thought you didn't take any notes whatsoever on the August 10th, 2015 interview. Well, that's what I'm asking. Are you saying my PowerPoint was based on a specific interview? No, what I'm actually asking is, are the notes that is defense exhibit one, which are the typewritten notes, are a lot of what's in your typewritten notes as far as what you typed that Mr. Harris had said, were those, those statements from Mr. Harris then placed into your PowerPoint to make the point you were gonna make at trial? So they weren't, they weren't literally the statements from Ross Harris into the PowerPoint, but I used the information in that interview to create the PowerPoint and to include that in the, yes, include that in the PowerPoint. I need to interrupt you all for a moment to talk to the clerk on unrelated scheduling matters. Um, so I'm going to do an aside. It's, we're talking two, three seconds. I'm sorry, I'm juggling several calendars. Is that well? It's what we do. 
All right, but that's an explanation of what's going on. I was working with the clerk to make everything, make sure everything else was attended to, and it is. So we're in good shape. All right, resume your cross examination, and thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Judge. So when we talk about confidentiality, um, Mr. Derman asked you, did you anticipate that your notes would be confidential? Why would you believe they'd be confidential? I didn't believe they would be confidential. I asked if they would be confidential. And who'd you ask? I asked Maddox Kilgore. And when did you ask him this? I asked him before both interviews. And both times he told you that these notes that you took about the interview with Mr. Harris would be confidential. Yes. Did he explain why he believed they would be confidential? No. Now, once the 50 slide PowerPoint had been completed, um, and I'm assuming that was sometime during the trial itself, which started on September 12th, 2016. Do you remember when you completed that PowerPoint? September 12th. Are we referring to uh, the first scheduled trial or the one that actually took place? Um, I'm actually referring to the actual trial that took place down in Brunswick, Georgia. Okay. Okay. And what I'm referring to is that when I say September 12, 2016, that's when jury selection started. So that would be when everybody's down there, the okay. attorneys are down there, Mr. Kilgore's down there. Um, um, were you, to your best of your recollection, were you still working on the 50 slide PowerPoint that you were about to testify to, or was it already completed at that point? It was completed prior to that date. And do you remember when you gave it to Mr. Kilgore? Um, no, but um, I believe the date was September 3rd. And When did you come down to testify in Brunswick? Uh, I was there the same day <clears throat> that the psychologist testified, and I, I believe I came in the day before. I came in the night before. Okay, so when you say the other person, that was that Dr. Gene Brewer? Right, I was there at the same time as him. Okay, so. Does November 3rd, 2016 sound about right for the day you were there to testify? Yes. All right, so you kind of came up from Tampa to Brunswick the night before. Correct. And what did you do the night before? Did you meet with Mr. Kilgore and the team? Yes, I did. All right, did you go over your testimony with them? Yes. And the morning of November 3rd, did you go to the courthouse? Yes. Where did you stay in the courthouse? I mean, did you see Dr. Brewer's testimony or were you somewhere else? No, I was sequestered in one of the rooms on the side of the courtroom. Okay, so at approximately, let's see. I think at approximately 11.57, a lunch break was taken. Um, do you recall meeting with the defense team uh, during the lunch break on November 3rd, 2016? I don't recall if I had lunch with them. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna get more specific. Forget eating with them. Did you actually meet with them anytime between 12 noon and one o'clock when the trial resumed? I don't recall. Okay, how were you informed that you were not going to actually be testifying that afternoon? Um, I think it was at the end of the day that I was told session is over, you're not going to be called. You haven't been called. To the best of my recollection, I wasn't told until the end of the day. Okay, and when you were told at the end of the day, where were you? In that same room, I spent the whole day in that, that room next to the courtroom. Okay. Um, so to the best of your recollection, 
Mr. Lumpkin, Mr. Rodriguez, and Mr. Kilgore never met with you at lunchtime on November 3rd, 2016 to talk to you about your anticipated testimony, to talk to you about what Dr. Brewer testified to, and to let you know whether you were going to be called as a witness or not. No. So when you were informed at the end of the day on November 3rd, 2016, that you were not going to testify that day, did they tell you to come back the next day? No. What were you told? I was told that I would not be called to testify. Okay. And no, that evening, November 3rd, did you leave and go back to Tampa? Yes. Did you ask them why? <coughs> I, I think I did, yeah. Okay, what'd they tell you? Uh, the, I remember most vividly, they said that they felt confident uh, about the case because um, it seemed that everyone in the courtroom seemed to think that he would be acquitted. Okay, and so they felt pretty good about uh, Dr. Brewer's testimony? They didn't comment on his testimony. Okay. Um, did they feel that they had sufficiently made a case for Mr. Harris and that they were going to prevail? Objection, Judge. I'm so sorry. Uh, I needed to jump in there and couldn't find my mute button. Um, now, now they're calling for speculation. I mean, uh, I, I think you can go in a little bit, and I have let him go in a little bit about the uh, you know that conversation because it goes to one of the other issues. But as far as what's in their minds, specifically what's in their minds, he doesn't know. He, you know. That's probably good. You can rephrase though. Thank you, Judge. So, Dr. Diamond, all I'm really looking for is specifically what the defense team, and it could be any one of them, specifically told you about why they had chosen not to call you to the stand for Mr. Harris. And what I recall is the, um, in a sense, surveying uh, people's opinions, it seemed that he would be acquitted. And you also mentioned they said something about confidence about the case. Do you recall specifically the words they used about that? No, they didn't say they were confident about the case. I don't know if I just said that. Um, but there was a sense that... Judge, again, I'm going to object to any sense that, that he had, uh, any anything of that nature. Well, that would depend on whose sense it is. My understanding is the witness is saying it was the sense of the defense team if that's the case, and it's clearly on objection, might be due for clarification. But if that's what he's saying, he can testify. If he's speaking about his sense of what they're saying, it is speculative, Mr. Dorman, you're correct. So, Ms. Dunkowski, I think you need to clarify that. Yes, Judge, I will. So, Dr. Diamond, what, we're, what I'm looking for is specifically what they were telling you. So it's not necessarily your sense of what you thought they were trying to communicate. I'm really looking for, did you know, they Judge, say? I, I think she's been asking, asking, now we're going, uh, you know, I think she was allowed to give a reason, but now we're going into some complete hearsay that uh, it would not be relevant any longer. That it has been asked and answered. I don't think I it's- them on cross. So uh, asked and answered, overruled. How about hearsay? Well, I'm working on it. If you give me a minute, Mr. Durham, I did pay attention. Mm -hmm. That's my back at you. My face went all covered up. Uh, what do you say about the hearsay uh, objection, Ms. Demikowski? Um, I agree. It would be hearsay. The problem, of course, is that I'm then going to want to ask Dr. Diamond to hang around in the waiting room until the other three attorneys testify because they are up on deck, so to speak, and in the waiting room and about to testify. So I would ask her a little leeway at this point in time, just for the convenience of the witness. So he doesn't have to spend another four hours sitting in his office waiting to be recalled for me to ask him this one question. I'm allowed over objection only uh, in the way that you've described and if it's not set up properly, it will be hearsay and it will be overruled. Otherwise, depending on how the other witnesses' testimony is developed, I'll take argument and decide its admissibility. Thank you, Judge. So, Dr. Diamond, once again, 
when I'm lo only looking for what they were saying to you, their sense of the trial was? What did they say to you? Their sense of the trial, not their personal opinion, but what they had heard from people in the courtroom was- Again, I'm going to object to what they heard from people in the courtroom. And that's what they shared with me, what they had heard in the courtroom. I'm going to make the same ruling. I'm going to allow it in and then we'll see how it develops an argument. Thank you, Judge. As obviously, I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted therein. So. Yes, yes that, that's what I'm going to hear the argument on later on. Great. All right. So after you had this conversation with the defense team, you then left and went back to Tampa. Is that fair enough? That's correct. If I may have one moment, John, just to make sure I've covered everything. I will pass the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Dunn, redirect. Um, Dr. Dunn, just a couple of quick things if I can, please. Um, <clears throat> now, you mentioned that you uh, plan to testify um, <clears throat> to certain uh, to certain things on, on um, cross, specifically they were talking about you were going to testify as to distraction, as to changing plan, as to sleep deprivation, and as to cue. Do you recall that? Yeah, that's all correct. All right. Uh, were you not also planning and um, testifying along with that PowerPoint and the examples that were provided in the PowerPoint and some of the examples that you gave today? That's correct. Yeah, so it wasn't limited to just the things that they listed there uh, for your testimony at trial. Correct. You were also going to testify and use your expertise in the 15 years that you've been in the field specializing in uh, children being forgotten in cars. You were going to uh, testify as your expertise and tie those cases in uh, to be how they were consistent with the fact that was found in um, Ross Harris's case. Is that right? Yes, I would have related the, <clears throat> the uh, incident uh, in Ross Harris's case to other cases in which I served as an expert. And um, then also, um, you were using your uh, history as far as a uh, brain memory expert, which you've been in that for 40 years. Uh, studying the brain and, and how it operates in, in, uh, in brain memory. And you're going to use that experience to tie um, the factors that you found into Ross Harris's specific case. Yes, I would have. In case of in other cases you've worked on. Yes. Now, um, you uh, mentioned they had talked to you a little bit about the newspaper articles uh, that you um, testified to on direct. Now, um, when you're using, uh, is it common for somebody with your, uh, in your field of expertise to you know, read newspaper articles and take news reports and uh, research? Is that part of the things that you do to base your opinions? Uh, are you asking me if I use media articles to base my opinions? Was that the question? Uh, specifically what I'm asking you, hang on, but specifically what I'm asking is that uh, if you are uh, reading newspaper articles or researching and reviewing newspaper articles or reports, is that something that experts in your field commonly uh, rely on when making their uh, opinions? Well, I consider it a source of information. It's not the final determinant of how I come to my opinions, <clears throat> but I think all information is potentially valuable. And my, uh, but again, my question though is, do other experts in your field uh, use the same practice? Is that common in your field? Yes, I would think it would be sense. common to use the media to gather information. And the case that you cited to then, uh, uh, you actually went out and did independent research, is that right? That's correct. So in the case of which the uh, detective forgot the gun in the bathroom, I went out on my own to confirm the, the circumstances that occurred in that article. Okay, but just to, uh, again, to be, uh, to clarify, because um, the uh, experts in your field uh, reasonably will rely on 
reviewing news reports or newspaper articles when they set up their opinions or when they form their opinions in their part of their research? Yes, definitely. Experts would be using uh, the media to uh, help influence or and help them to come to a final conclusion and opinions. Now, um, let's go back to the uh, interview, the Ross Harris interview. It was the second interview, but I think the confusion we had on uh, Cross was um, it's listed as D1, but it's actually the second interview. Okay. Um, so that was the time that you, uh, now, if I remember right, did you go into the jail uh, with a laptop? Yes. And the state took you down the list of a lot of things that, um, Your Honor, is there any way I can impose upon Brett real quick to put up D1? Audrey's going to help us. There we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we can slide down just a little bit, please. Um, a little further down to the, all right. Um, when you're talking about, they got to the express, to the spots past issues for the second interview. Now, um, you had testified that um, some of those things, I think were Ross Harris's words on direct. Do you recall that? Excuse me, I'm cross. You recall that the words of Ross Harris, I think you were asked. Yes, I recall. Now, um, could some of those things have been uh, Ross Harris's words, or could some of them have been things that you had pre typed in before you even met Ross Harris that day that you gained from your, uh, res your research and review of the evidence and your conversations with counsel, or both? It's, it's both. A good bit of it was what I had typed in in advance, uh, and some of it uh, had included his answers. All right, so these were, not all of this is just what Ross told you, but his other things as far as what your findings were and things that you had already listed down as being important, as well as the council had talked to you about as being important. That's correct. And there's certain things on here that you, uh, you slide down a little further, please. Um, and there's certain things on this D1 uh, uh, bottom of this page that you're certain also, well, let me rephrase that. Are there things here that you know that uh, the attorneys gave you and not Ross Harris? I'm quite certain that I was given that specific time, 1240, in which he had sent a work email <clears throat> that I would have gotten from the attorneys and that 1248 AM that he was applying for a passport. And let's go to the second page, please. And on the second page, when you um, went in and um, you said, well, these are the words of Ross Harris uh, on several lists through these. Again, are any of those you're certain are just Ross Harris's words or could they have been words of uh, counsel and yourself that was already typed in? My best recollection it would be that this is what I got directly from Ross Harris at the top of this page. At the top of this page, okay. And uh, so would that have been typed in that day? I would think so. Okay. And then um, the, the part in bold is uh, it says need to find out original meeting time. Uh, you've already, I believe you've already testified that is a specific note to yourself for something you needed to check out because it was important to your findings. That's correct. Just to confirm that he did have an early meeting time that day. <clears throat> and, and now um, as, we, as we scroll down there, um, and 
going past the uh, traffic out of Chick-fil-A. Um, and the questions about knowledge of how to erase and more forgotten, we've gone over that, but I want to be specific, make sure it's crystal clear, or at least with me anyway, are these things that you got from Ross Harris or were they typed in there before you ever met with him? That was typed in before I met with him. There's no answers or anything there. Those are just things that you thought were important or the attorneys thought were important. That's Another. just something I thought was, was important. <clears throat> and, um, and and with all with all those questions, it was the next three questions, starting with knowledge, more and more, those were um, what you thought were important, and you That's correct. You walked there. Okay. And as far as the first two I talked about, knowledge of how to erase internet history, you don't have an answer there, do you? No, I don't. And you don't have an answer to the second uh, question you have there either, do you? About uh, more about forgotten baby. No, I don't. Now, the hypothetical, you put that in there all by yourself, did you not? Yes, I did. And um, you have here, you couldn't answer the question other than to talk techie. Now, it was, it was, um, that, that's added right after that question mark. Is that, is that correct? That's, well, I'm sorry, what was your question? All right, uh, you typed in, couldn't answer the question other than to talk kit, uh, techie right after that, uh, those, those list of questions. Is that correct? I'm sorry, again, I couldn't hear the last thing you said. Right. Very last portion of the question on a hypothetical where it said, you, is that um, you typed in after the questions and is it not uh, his exact response, is that, or is it his exact response? That, no, that's not his exact response. That was just my impression of what he was saying. And again, this is something you put down there uh, and that you wanted to know, but it was also um, something he thought was going to be confidential. That's correct. That you were told about counsel. Correct. And the last page, again, are those things that were exactly things he told you or were those things that came before you got there or the type before you got there and he either confirmed or they're just questions? Now, are you talking here traffic out of Chick-fil-A? Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, let's go to page three, please. <clears throat> Can we go to the next page, please? Now, when we're going down from um, the forward facing seats and all that, would those be things that you uh, typed in while you were talking to him or would those be things that could be a combination of both his responses and things that you had uh, uh, came in there with, with pre-knowledge from the attorneys and your research? That would have been uh, something I typed in at the time. And then the very last line, uh, excuse me, second to last line, Midnight Project, different. We've gone over this, but again, there's questions there with, that you have where things are written down and um, in particular about things that you think are important and that you need to check out later on. Where, what are you referring to? The very, um, the last line, uh, when saved, there's a question mark. If you could slide down a little further, please. Could, the uh, when saved and there's a question mark. That's just a question for me to uh, follow up on. And again, that's not something Ross told you. Those are, that's part of what you're doing as an expert in this case, uh, you, information that you need to seek out things important. That's correct. Part of your work product. Correct. Thank you. I don't have anything else at this time, Judge. Further examination by the state. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Diamond, is it fair to say that if you had not interviewed Ross Harris, you would not have been able to render an opinion at trial? Is that correct? 
That's correct. And so therefore you had to have based your opinion um, about the consistency um, between prospective memory failure and his actions on his two interviews. Is that correct? That's correct. So it was very important that you interview him and hear what he had to say, and that formed the basis of your opinion that you were going to give at trial. Correct. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Can the witness be excused? You may. Thank you for the time, sir. From the state, yes. We're free to go, Dr. Diamond. Mr. Durham, do you have further evidence? I do, Judge. Um, Go ahead and call on Max Kilgore. All right. Is Mr. Kilgore available? There he is. What do we need to do? Does he need to come online? He's there. Yeah, there he is. All right, Mr. Durham, Mr. Uh, Kilgore's on uh, Zoom. If you'll switch to the examination. Just give me one second. He's covering his face. Okay, uh, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give this court in a matter pending before it shall be the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Tell us your name, please. Maddox Kilgore. And what do you do for a living, Max, Mr. Kilgore? I'm, I'm an attorney. Where at? Marietta, Georgia. And how long have you been an attorney? Since uh, 1994. Where'd you go to school? At Emory University and Samford University. And um, what did you, uh, have you been uh, in private practice your entire career? No. And um, he, um, what did you do when you first got out of school? Uh, so I was a law clerk for a few years. I was a law clerk uh, in the Superior Court of Cobb County for a short time. Then I was a uh, law assistant on the Georgia Supreme Court for Justice Harris Hines. Uh, and after about two years as a law clerk, I was uh, an assistant attorney general in the state of Georgia. Uh, for uh, Worked for Thurbert Baker. Um, and then, um, um, and, and Mr. Bowers uh, did that for about uh, five years or so. Um, I was in the criminal division, <clears throat> handled habeas corpus and uh, appeals before the Georgia Supreme Court. Then I, um, then I was a prosecutor in the Superior Court of Cobb County, um, worked for Mr. Pat Head, who was the DA at the time. And I was there about six years or so, um, tried felony cases. And then I went into the private practice of law the uh, uh, January of 2006. Okay. And uh, in the, your time you've been in private practice, uh, do you have a um, degree of concentration uh, in, in the type of cases you do? Criminal defense. And, uh, do you do, uh, what kind of cases do you represent people on? Uh, well, really, any kind of any anything related to criminal defense, 
uh, misdemeanors and felonies uh, also do uh, have done a lot of post conviction work. I've done lots of uh, motions for new trial and and direct appeals. Well, did you um, uh, have you done murder cases? I have. And did you um, have occasion to uh, represent um, Ross Harris? Start representing him in this case. In this case, he, we're here for today. I did. When did you start representing Ross? My, my recollection is that Ross's family came to see me the uh, morning after he was arrested, which was June of 2014. Okay, and did he, um, so it was immediately after he was arrested then, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Did anybody help you with their case, with this case? <clears throat> Yes, over the course of the next um, two years, my law partner, Carlos Rodriguez, worked on the case. Uh, another attorney, uh, Brian Lumpkin, a local attorney in Marietta, uh, worked on the case. Uh, the two of them were co-counsel with me. We also had uh, uh, assistance from um, at least one private investigator um, and there, there may have been, we may have had some additional help, but those were the primary, uh, that's the primary assistance that I had. Okay, and did you, um, when you're doing a case like this, and well, just specifically this case, um, did y'all, uh, after you got through and we began reviewing the evidence, did y'all ever get a, a theory of the defense or the plans about uh, how to handle the representation of Ross Harris? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, early on, uh, early on, it was clear that we were going to have a, a legal defense of, uh, of accident that was um, based on memory failure. And, um, and that was, uh, I think that defense pretty early on was going to be uh, based um, largely on the work of Dr. David Diamond. We expected to, uh, uh, for him to be the, the primary witness uh, as far as the legal defense goes of memory failure uh, of accident. Um, uh, as it turns out, we, we, uh, we had to turn over his, uh, some work product confidential notes and uh, that, that pretty much scuttled um, that scuttled our ability to call him as a witness. And so we'll get to, um, that. We'll get to that in a second. Let's, but your theory of the case though, you talked about um, the, he was the centerpiece. What other pieces did you have for the accident portion? Uh, well, for the memory failure portion, um, we had another expert that we, we got later on uh, and that was Dr. Brewer from Arizona State. So he was going to be, uh, and he did testify. He was going to be part of that uh, that that accident defense. Uh, I, I mean, those you know, the the experts were the big the big part of the memory failure defense. But the um, the the context of the trial, the other witnesses that were called, there was of course a lot of other evidence that. Um, undergirded or supported the uh, memory failure defense. But I don't, I, I want to make, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, I, but I think to more fully answer your question, um, very early on, we, we developed a strategy that um, uh, we knew we were going to have to employ and we did employ a trial and that was really to uh, undermine the um, uh, motive theory of the state. Um, and we were going to do that by challenging the credibility of the state's witnesses, primarily the law enforcement officers and the uh, state's experts. Um, the state had suggested a motive that Ross wanted to uh, li basically live child free uh, in order to pursue uh, extramarital sexual liaisons. And um, we, we, we determined um, throughout the course of preparation that there was no um, objective evidence of such a motive. Um, 
And as it turns out, what the state really had, uh, we, we felt what they had and what they were putting up to uh, sort of carry that motive was bad character evidence and um, uh, some very misleading uh, false testimony of uh, the law enforcement officers and experts. And uh, I, I know that, you know, the defense doesn't have a burden of proof to prove anything. Uh, but in a case like this, uh, you know, there's a there's a dead baby. And um, we certainly believed that it was incumbent upon us to uh, 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 prove that the law enforcement officers were not credible that the state's experts were, um, were not credible, uh, that, you know, they were, they were lying to uh, sort of fit their narrative. And um, I mean, th there was, and we had a lot of ammunition in that regard, including uh, a lot of false testimony that was given during the probable cause hearing. Uh, um, and we did get to, we did get to um, challenge the uh, detective on that false testimony. Um, but we felt. All right, let me just. Uh, we're we're going to. Uh, we'll, we'll go to that. I just want to break down right now. The um, so you had basically, as I'm understanding it, it was a two prong uh, that you were, you were focused on, and and one would be uh, the legal defense, and the other would be in a very strong part of your uh, case was attacking the state's motive. Is that for some reason? Yes. yes. All right. Now going back to the um, the first prong, the legal portion with uh you had dr burton diamond and dr brewer how how are you going to work those guys together well uh dr diamond uh is uh, he was and is um probably the the most renowned expert on this uh paradigm which occurred in this case and that is memory failure of a parent leaving a, leaving a child in a car um, and Dr. Diamond had, uh, and, and he's an academic, um, but he's, 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 um, uh, he, he is, he's done, he's a forensic expert as well. And by that, I mean, sort of where the law intersects with this, uh, with this science, uh, Diamond is the guy who has handled lots and lots of these cases. He's consulted with prosecutors with uh, defense attorneys, uh, with other experts, uh, um, uh, defendants, and he, um, he has an expertise, a, a very hands-on expertise in, um, in these types of cases. In other words, he's, he's the guy who's handled a lot of these firsthand. Um, Dr. Brewer, on the other hand, um, uh, he got involved in the case much later. He was a, um, uh, he's a very sharp guy, uh, but he is clearly an academic. Uh, Dr. Brewer uh, at that time ran a memory study uh, laboratory at Arizona State University. And um, what he had to bring the table was, uh, was uh, essentially a, an academic perspective on memory failure. And um, so what, but he had no practical experience. He had never handled any sort of case uh, involving uh, the death of a child where, where there had been a memory failure. Uh, he, he, he just didn't have that experience. So uh, the intent and the plan was for Dr. Brewer to uh, sort of come in as a strictly scientific academic guy, um, lay down the basics for what uh, uh, the construct of memory failure uh, from a scientific perspective, and then have Dr. Diamond come in, who is also uh, a scientist, but have Dr. Diamond come in and um, be able to really be the, the cleanup hitter, if you will, for him to uh, make the connection between the science and the, the, the paradigm of these cases happening in, in the real world. You know, our, our hope was that he would be able to um, offer very strong opinion that uh, what he observed in this case was uh, consistent with memory failure, 
Uh, but more importantly than that probably is that uh, we, we had hoped and expected David Diamond to be able to testify that uh, what he observed in this case was consistent with memory failure um, he had seen in numerous, numerous other um, cases where children were forgotten in cars. Okay, and did you, uh, you all wind up employing uh, Dr. Diamond? Yes. Yeah, you remember meeting with him? So uh, we worked extensively with Dr. Diamond over a period of probably, uh, well, certainly more than a year, maybe even a year and a half. Uh, we flew him up, we flew him up to Marietta and he, um, he met with us in our office, I, I want to say at least twice. We provided him with um, numerous materials and videos and thumb drives and reports. Uh, in this case, we took him to the scenes. We took him to drive the scenes, uh, to drive the route in question. Um, we flew down to Tampa and met with him at uh, the University of South Florida um, for, gosh, it seemed like half a day uh, for him to uh, try to help us understand the science of memory failure. So, uh, I mean, he was a, uh, he was all in, that's for certain. Uh, he was certainly willing to help us uh, understand the science and uh, he was certainly willing to offer his opinion that uh, this was a case of memory failure. And um, so when you, you mentioned all the times that you spoke, well, not all the times, but uh, y'all y'all met now, um, did you have other communications with him other than meeting him face to face as far as uh, uh, phone calls, emails, things like that? Of course. And did, what, did you give him information? I'm sorry, bitch, say again. Did you provide him information? He was provided a tremendous amount of data on this case, including recordings and videos, um, reports. Um, I, I, I've probably, I mean, I've been practicing, you know, 26 years. I don't know that I've ever worked as closely hand in hand with an expert um, on strategy quite as much as we worked with Dr. Diamond because, well, the reality is, he, he knew so much more about this paradigm than we did. I mean, he's, he's, he'd handled a whole bunch of these cases and we'd never handled a case like this. And um, so when y'all met with, uh, when y'all met with him, uh, tell me about the meeting here. Um, the first time that y'all met with him, tell us about that one. So um, to the best of my recollection, Both times that uh, Dr. Diamond came to Marietta, we made arrangements for him to go to the jail. I think the very first time we may have met Ross with him in the jail. Um, it, I mean, this has been, I mean, it's been quite a few years ago, but that's my recollection that we may have gone to the jail with him to meet with Ross to kind of a meet and greet, I guess, if you will. Uh, but most of the time with Dr. Diamond, definitely on that first trip, was spent in our office going through uh, sort of uh, the things about the case that we knew and the things about the case that we were concerned about. There. I'm sorry? Who was there at that meeting? Uh, at that first meeting... Um, my recollection is that it was myself and my law partner, Carlos Rodriguez, and I believe that the investigator, uh, the investigator was present during that first meeting. And, um, what was, uh, y'all were, were y'all, you know, were telling, um, Dr. Diamond information and providing him information about the case? Yes. Did um, y'all show him at that time? Did y'all show him any uh, videos or any of the evidence at that time? So, um, because we met on more than one occasion, 
I, I don't have a crystal clear recollection of when we showed him what evidence. Um, we absolutely showed him video recordings in our office, uh, as well as uh, as well as provided him with uh, some sort of digital medium. Uh, there was at some point we definitely sent him a thumb drive with some recordings on it, but in our office we absolutely went over the evidence with him. What we went over on the first occasion versus the second occasion, I just don't have a, a crystal clear recollection. All right. Well, what uh, what was Dr. Diamond doing while you guys were um, providing him with this information or while he was reviewing information? You talking about at our office? Uh -huh. um, well, he had his laptop out, so um, he was he was. Um, he was working on his laptop and he was asking a lot of questions. And y'all were, what were y'all providing him? Well, <laughs> I would say it was a combination of uh, facts, um, uh, objective facts that we knew from, uh, from the case. Uh, we were providing him uh, information that Ross had given us, in, in other words, from our conversations with Ross, we were providing him with our uh, opinions about the evidence, and we were providing him with um, opinions about our strategy going forward. So y'all were telling him things that y'all were working on in the case and as far as how you wanted things that you wanted to highlight or try that you thought were concerns? Yes. And was he, what was he doing when you're telling him that information? Um, well, he had his laptop out. He was typing and asking questions. Okay. All right. And um, so did y'all, did you go with him and have an occasion to go with him and uh, the people to meet Doc, uh, with Dr. Diamond to meet uh, Ross Harris? Yes. And uh, tell about that, please. So, first to the time, best one, one at a time. I'm sorry, say again. Let's do it one at a time. What happened on the first meeting when y'all went there? So, uh, to the best of my recollection, the first time we, uh, Dr. Diamond was in Marietta, we went to the jail with him and we, we met with Ross. And my, my recollection is it was kind of a meet and greet. I, I, I just don't recall, I just do not recall whether or not we left and Diamond met with him privately that first time. I, I just don't recall. I just don't. Okay, but do you, all right. Um, and uh, do you know, um, did y'all talk a lot about the case then? Or what kind of meeting was it? You said, oh, you, did you say meet and greet? Did I hear that right? So the, the, the very first time that we were present with Ross and Dr. Diamond in the jail, um, I, I, that's the only way that I can characterize it. Um, we, we definitely had a conversation about the case. Um, I, at this time, I do not recall if it was more uh, biographical or case specific. Um, and when I say meet and greet, I don't mean five minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my recollection is, is that we, we talked to him for a while. I, I did not take notes of that meeting. So I can't, uh, I, I can't at this time recall specifically the topics that were covered. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident it, it included a, a lot of biographical information, a lot of background information about Ross, because obviously this is the first time that Diamond was meeting him. Um, Okay. And um, I, I believe, uh, in fact, I'm certain that Diamond asked him a, a couple of questions, but at this time, I don't, I don't recall what they were. Do you recall um, talking with Dr. Diamond about um, whether or not anything he, uh, any of his notes were confidential? So that topic absolutely came up during the course of 
our relationship. Okay. Do you remember what you told him? Um, My recollection is, is that the topic was discussed several times, um, both before and after the state uh, asked for his notes. Um, and, and, and my recollection was that we would have told him, or we did tell him like any other expert, uh, that his notes, you, you know, any work product were confidential. And, um, okay, so, um... Now, do you, um, recall, uh, preparing your opening argument for the case? So I've had a chance to, uh, glance over that. So I have refreshed my memory somewhat to the opening argument. Did you make reference to Dr. Diamond in the opening? I don't, I, I don't recall. Okay. I, I do recall that we we talked about the fact there was going to be expert testimony that uh, went directly to uh, memory failure. Uh, I'm certain I, I, I'm certain that I mentioned the fact there would be expert testimony. Okay, and did you um, your, your purpose for Dr. Diamond? was um, you, you'd mentioned before, and I wanna make sure we, we get it here and don't get confused. What was specifically the difference between using him as opposed to Dr. Brewer? So <clears throat> um, again, Dr. Diamond had handled a lot of these kinds of cases and could give very specific opinion uh, he could give specific opinion testimony that what he observed in this case was consistent with other like cases of memory failure where parents had left their uh, children in cars. Um, I, I think that's, I mean, if you're looking for one thing that really sums up that that's what the difference was. I mean, he, he could offer that opinion and um, Dr. Brewer could not. Um, and, and, and let me, let me, let me interject this. Um, Dr. Brewer had, had, because he had never worked on anything like this before, he was extremely, extremely reticent to give firm opinions. Um, and he, he was extremely reticent to give an opinion that, uh, in this particular case, it was a, um, the result of a memory failure, um, you know, we didn't think that his inability to give a, a, that opinion was um, really, quite frankly, was detrimental because the science that he was going to be talking about was the science was the science. And it's the same thing that, you know, Dr. Diamond was going to talk about. Um, but I think one thing really sort of, you know, makes the point here in um, in when Dr. Brewer testified. The very first question that the state asked him was, you are not here to give this jury an opinion that this incident here was a failure of memory systems. And um, his response was, no, that's not my role. Um, had that same question been asked to Dr. Diamond, his, his response would have been, absolutely, that's my opinion. It was absolutely a a uh, uh, this case is a uh, result of a failure of, me of memory, uh, just like uh, so many of the other cases that I've looked at. Um, I, I, so I think that's um, I, I think that was a big a big difference in in the two of them. Um, I mean, there were a lot of little things. Uh, Dr. Brewer is able to discuss the um, concept of false memory, um, but he could only do it in a very general way. Um, and, uh, you know, in other words, he could say, well, you know, there's, there's information out there that parents 
uh, in these cases, parents tend to report that they have, uh, they have a specific memory of dropping their child off at daycare. Um, Dr. Diamond, on the other hand, um, on that topic, you know, would have been able to come in and speak with great authority that uh, he, had, he had been involved in, you know, dozens of cases specifically involving false memory. Um, so that's just, I mean, that's just an example of, you know, some of the things that I see were very, um, were very different. Um, I did, I did, in looking through the transcript, I noticed that uh, Dr. Brewer was um, uh, crossed a little bit about whether or not there were, um, he was familiar with a case involving a memory failure over such a short drive. And uh, of course he's, he, you know, Dr. Brewer testified, well, I've never worked on any of these cases. Um, well, you know, that was an important issue in this case because the drive that Ross made from Chick-fil-A to Home Depot was very, very short. Well, Dr. Diamond, because he's handled so many of these cases, I mean, he would have been able to say, absolutely. Uh, in fact, you can, uh, there, there are instances where the, um, the time for the memory failure was shorter. The drive was actually shorter than this one. And I have very distinct memory of Dr. Diamond telling us that. So, I mean, those are just some, those are just some um, examples of how, how I think that Diamond would have been a, a, a you know, a different witness given a different kind of testimony. Well, um, did you, uh, do you recall these, um, before we get into uh, the, the motion to compel, let's go into some other things. When you looked at this case, did you file what motions? Uh, did, well, did you file a motion to sever? So, I, I apologize. What are you asking me? Well, I'm going to ask about a few of the motions. We're going to go into some more later on, but just a few of the motions. Not, not as much detail right now, but did you file, happen to file a motion to sever in this case? Yes. And previously you had mentioned uh, the bad character evidence that you were concerned about coming in. Is that one of the reasons you filed a motion to sever? Yes. Okay. And uh, you filed a motion to, uh, motions in limine in this case as, as well. Some of those doing with that bad character. Yes. Okay. Now you've also recalled the state filing uh, motions in the case as well. Yes. And in particular one is a motion to compel. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, tell me about the motion to compel. Let's talk about that one right now. Well, the, the state was asking for the court to make us turn over the notes for uh, Dr. Diamond. And what notes were they asking for? I apologize. I don't have the, I don't, I don't have that motion right in front of me. All right. Uh, do you have to happen to have the order in front of you? Uh, hold on one moment. Let me see if I can locate it. There may have been multiple iterations of their motion, but, um, So the, the state uh, wanted uh, to disclose um, documentation regarding a statement the defendant gave him. And what was the file? So I, I think the state's motion was uh, frankly quite broad, quite broad in what they were asking for. Um, in refreshing my recollection, um, I mean, it appears they're really asking for any 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 notes of any notes of um, Dr. Diamond that uh, even touched on um, 
even touched on conversations with with Ross Harris. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've I've got one that shows that it was um, submitted April the 9th. Okay. I think we actually got the motion prior to that. I think they emailed it to us or gave it to us a couple of days before, though. Okay. All right. And did that motion, um, did you have a hearing on the motion? Yes. Did you consent to them getting the materials? Absolutely not. Okay. What was your concern about the uh, materials? Uh, well, got uh, quite a quite a few concerns that I had. Um, first and foremost, this was um, uh, Dr. Diamond had told me very clearly that he did not have a recordation uh, of any specific responses that um, uh, that Ross had given him. Um, Dr. Diamond made very, very clear, very clear what he had was um, essentially a go by, which were some notes that he had taken into the jail uh, to uh, allow him to um, uh, talk to Ross. In other words, to refresh his recollection of what he needed to talk to Ross about. Um, and um, so those those notes and that go by that that he had, uh, they were based on conversations that he had with the lawyers that he had with us. And um, my understanding is that he then took he, he took those notes into the jail and I don't know if he took them on paper or on a computer, but my understanding is he took them into the jail and then at some point may have amended or supplemented those notes with either his own impressions or uh, maybe even a specific response that Ross had given him. But, but they were all, everything was combined in just a couple of pieces of paper. Um, and so, yeah, I was, um, I, I, we, we were extraordinarily concerned that uh, this, you know, confidential work product, which was notes between the lawyer and the expert, um, uh, were going to have to be turned over. Um, and we were concerned for lots of reasons. Um, I, I mean, I, I specifically, I sp very specifically warned Dr. Diamond that this was going to create a real problem with credibility uh, if they had his notes that he could, they could then, the state could then come in and demand that he uh, give an answer for every issue, every statement that was on that piece of paper, answer the question the way that, that um, Ross Harris had answered it. And, and of course that would have put Dr. Diamond in an incredibly uh, difficult position. First of all, this was months and months and months and months before trial. Uh, to try to recall that information, um, you know, so that was, I, I, I definitely knew that was going to be a problem with his credibility uh, or a challenge to his credibility, but more problematic than that, there were certain statements on, there were certain statements in this uh, uh, work product in these notes that um, uh, the state was asking for that, you um, uh, we were concerned that the state could then take those those statements and turn them around and give whatever meaning the state wanted them to me. And, and, and let me and let me just give you an example. I, I've got the, the notes in front of me. So on page two, uh, he's got in his notes uh, knowledge of how to erase Internet search history more about forgotten baby dog search history. Well, these were extremely contested issues. There, there was no objective. We're gonna get there just later. I don't want you to All get right. too far ahead of me. Um, when you had the hearing, now did you, uh, you, you expressed uh, the concerns you had to the court? I have very little recollection, uh, a ve very little recollection of the first hearing. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I didn't dream in a million years there was any possibility that the court was going to make us turn over these notes. And, and, and um, 
If I dropped the ball in the first hearing, I dropped the ball, but I, I just don't have any recollection of what we argued that the, the in court that day. Okay. Do you recall, uh, you mentioned you, you, that was the first hearing. Do you recall a subsequent hearing? Absolutely. Um, uh, do you recall that one better? Very much so. Why? Well, because um, uh, we made our point very um, uh, strongly to the court that that these were work product that should not have to be turned over, and there was nothing. There was no. There was no law in Georgia. There was no statute. There was there was nothing that would have covered these particular notes uh, to be required to be turned over. Uh, and of course, by that time, I had, um, uh, you know, after we mulled over uh, what was actually on these notes, uh, I mean, we were extremely, extremely concerned about the state getting these. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, I, my recollection is I basically begged the court not to have to turn over these notes. That, that, that is my recollection of, of sort of at least what at least what uh, our mindset was at the time and what my mindset was at the time, uh, because I knew uh, I knew what kind of problem that it was going to cause, going to cause us and going to cause uh, our expert. Yeah, you know, you and, and, and let me let me let me just follow up on that. M you know, uh, my recollection is that uh, uh, even even the prosecutor um, said something to the court about, well, maybe we need to sort of let them redact any of the work product stuff so that it's not a problem. And the court said, nope, nope, as is. Turn it, they got to turn it all over. Okay. And uh, did you um, did you explain the legal arguments to the court as well? I mean, that you were begging the court, but did you explain your legal arguments as well uh, in, in, in the court hearing? Yes, I did. And also, you filed a written motion um, in opposed to that, did you not? Yes, I did. Actually, uh, when we rephrase it, it was a motion of reconsideration of her direction about giving um, over the materials. Yes. Okay. And um, now, were y'all required and um, to give uh, all of the statements in the end that were taken, all the uh, all the writings and uh, statements? Uh, regarding any conversation in any manner. To, That's uh, my recollection. And um, so let's go over that. Uh, you have you said you had those interview notes with you? Yes. And um, Judge, if we could, I'd like to see if the court uh, could um, help me out again with uh, D1. I think we're getting it done. Thank you. There. Okay, um, Mr. Kilgore, um, let's go over this. We, um, do you have any um, recollection as far as to talking to Dr. Diamond? about um, the first line underneath the second level where it says habit pattern. Uh, so that, that was something that we talked about uh, extensively, extensively wow. with, with Dr. Diamond. And that was when you say we talked about it. Is that uh, you and the trial team? Yes. Okay. And um, and it, did y'all tell him your what you wanted him to find out about that? How you you thought it may relate to the case? We 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 told him what we knew about. We told him what we knew about it. And because he he had done so many of these cases, I mean, he really knew what to follow up on. But we we told him what we knew about. Uh, the habit and the pattern uh, in this particular case, or at least what we knew at that point in time. Okay. Now you mentioned what you knew in that point in time. Um, was this case unusual in, um, in complex in how it 
information came in at, at different times? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, uh, the, uh, the volume of information was unlike any, anything that any of the lawyers had ever been involved in. Uh, we're talking terabytes uh, because there was so much digital information. Um, dozens and dozens and dozens of witnesses, many, many experts in different disciplines. Uh, but it was really the, 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 uh, the data uh, and, and, of course, recordings. I mean, there were, I can't even tell you how many recordings there were. Um, there was a, a, a pharaoh scan done and uh, recreation, um, uh, essentially a, an animated uh, recreation done. All right. Um, well, let me do. But as far as uh, when I'm talking about the electronic, was there certain things um, that were in question early on uh, that you may have had question about that got cleared up later as more digital information became available? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about that in relation to this uh, first page here. So, um, can we slide this? Down? Uh, can, can it be scrolled? Okay, right there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, did I go too far, Maddox? But is there something on this page that, uh, that deals with that? So, um, do you mind restating the question, please? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we'll get to it. I know it's on the second page, but these, these things right here at the bottom of D1, the thing about the, um, the time frames, uh, do you recall talking to Dr. Diamond about those? Oh, absolutely. Uh, ab absolutely. Um, we, at, at some point in time, we had, we had some information about uh, some digital information, either from uh, cell phone download. Uh, I think we had a cell phone download pretty early on. Um, and then we had additional information where laptops were downloaded. Uh, and at some point in time, uh, we knew that uh, there was an email that came in to Ross uh, from his work in the middle of the night, the night before. Um, and we knew that Ross had been searching for passport fees uh, for Cooper because uh, he was planning a cruise. Uh, he was planning on taking his family on a cruise, including Cooper. And we discovered that he had um, been looking for passport fees in the middle of the night. Um, I think this may have been some information that we, we, we might have gotten a little, a little bit earlier on. Okay. Uh, let me see, if we can, uh, please, clerk, slide up just a little bit closer to the top again, where it says issues for the second interview. Right there, please. Thanks. All right. Now, underneath uh, issues for the second uh, interview, you, you see um, kind of a list of things. Did y'all talk to Dr. Diamond about these things that are coming down there from um, the more discussions about the relationship with Cooper, things like that? that Scroll all the way down to uh, the time frames you were just referring to. Do you recall having specific conversations with um, Dr. Dunn about these things? Yes, I am confident that these were the things that we discussed with him in our office that um, uh, we found significant and wanted him to follow up on. All right, let's go ahead and go to the second page, please. All right. All right, thank you. Now, um, anything at this top of this page that, we, that stands out to you about conversations that uh, you had with uh, Dr. Uh, Diamond, that, that information would have been provided by y'all that you thought was important?
So I think it, I think that it's all important. Okay. Um, uh, this is all stuff that we talked to Dr. Diamond about. Uh, every bit of it, every every bit of this is stuff that we talked to him about. Um, so the, the, the last item there received a message in route of a change in meeting time, uh, may have changed his route, but may not, not totally sure of plan. So uh, this, this was a, 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 an issue we believed was of great importance um, that dealt with, there was some digital evidence that indicated that, that Ross had some kind of meeting that morning and some sometime during the morning, he he was notified of a change in time for his meeting, which uh, we we believed at that time uh, was the basis of why he he uh, amended his morning and changed his schedule uh, and made a decision last minute to take to take Cooper to breakfast. Um. But the, 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 exact, the exact timing of when that email was received and read um, in conjunction with some, some other evidence, that was something that we, we were not yet entirely clear on. Um, and I think that's why it says may have changed his route, but may, but may not, not totally sure of a plan. Um, I will tell you that in preparation for trial, um, we spent um, a, a lot of time on that very issue right there. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we mapped out routes. Uh, we mapped out all kind of routes and we laid, uh, we laid out over it the, the different uh, times uh, of the digital evidence, trying to sort of reconstruct um, when he had received this message and, and how it impacted his, his morning. Um, but I believe at the time of this, at the time we talked to Dr. Diamond about it, um, I don't think we yet fully understood uh, the evidence and how we, we could use it. Okay. And did that clear up uh, later on after you received more digital information? It certainly cleared up enough for us to be confident in how to, how to use the evidence. Yes. Okay. All right. And, but at the initial time you met with Dr. Diamond, you didn't hadn't had that information yet. Well, we had we had some information, but uh, we we had enough we had sufficient information to know that there was the that there was something about an email and a change in in time, uh, excuse me, a change in a scheduled meeting that was going to have some effect very likely had some effect on Ross changing his plans that very morning. Um, but, but understand this, it, it's not enough. Uh, it's not enough for Ross to tell us that or for us to believe it because it, we had to have, we had to be able to pin it down with the digital evidence. Uh, right. Because if we, you know, if we asserted something that he had changed his, his, uh, his morning routine as a result of uh, an email, and then it turns out we were wrong about it, well, then, you know, we're going to lose credibility with the jury. Um, so that, so I, you know, th that wasn't, that was an evolving issue as we prepared for trial and continued to uh, review evidence. And right below that, it, it, in bold, it says need to find out original meeting time. And, uh, does, do you, is that something you guys talked about as well? Absolutely. Uh, please understand that uh, part of what Dr. Diamond taught us about um, the the about memory failures uh, has has to do with habit and a change in pattern. And so, um, if we could establish that, you know, he, he had some, there was some change in the morning um, that would have altered his his routine in any way. Well, that was going to have some bearing. On whether or not this might might uh, you know might be a good case to um, uh, for memory failure. And um, going down to the next line, there's something about uh, the, the, some information about the Chick Fil A manager. Now, when did y'all? I mean, is that something Ross would have known? I mean, to your knowledge, absolutely not. Why not? He he didn't remember that. 
he, he didn't have any recollection of it. We, I, we, that was something at some point in time, and, and, and remember there is an enormous amount of information in this case. And so, um, you know, it took numerous, numerous, numerous conversations with Ross just to tell him what we knew about the evidence. Uh, but my recollection is, is that Ross had no, no knowledge of any, anything about the manager at Chick-fil-A. I mean, that's something that we, we believed was important after talking to Dr. Diamond, uh, because it may have had an impact on whether or not Ross was tired that morning, whether he was exhausted, uh, or whether he was in a hurry. And Dr. Diamond explained to us that those kinds of things, you know, uh, were part of his analysis of whether or not there was a memory failure. And so uh, that's, I mean, that's why we discussed that with him. Now, did you, um, did you do, have a, do a drive around with Dr. Diamond as far as uh, the Chick-fil-A area and the Home Depot area? Yeah. Am I the only one that doesn't hear anything? He appears to be frozen. Yeah, okay, thank you. I was beginning to think it was me. What's wrong? Your Honor, I believe that Mr. Kilgore's uh, feed has stopped and he is now frozen, so we are unable to communicate with him. He'll figure it out. There he is. Can you hear me, Mitch? I can't <laughs> now, but uh, <laughs> so that was a, a great answer that you can repeat because we didn't hear anything else. So as far as the drive goes, the answer to the question is yes. That. Are you still there? Uh, I am. Uh, we uh, went just back to the mirrored screen, but we need D1, um, please. All right, well, while you're fooling with that, I will tell you, yes, we we drove the routes with Dr. Diamond, but in addition to that, we provided, we provided Dr. Diamond with the um, recording where Detective Stoddard had drive on several uh, several runs all right now um sliding down a little bit about the um knowledge about how to erase an internet history and question mark um <coughs> we, you mentioned earlier about that uh and it stops you uh did, did this cause you any concern? Yes, that I mean that probably that probably gave us more concern than anything else in in the notes. Why? Well, because the uh, the objective evidence was that uh, there there was no evidence that Ross had um, erased his search history. Um because the state wanted to suggest that, that uh, he had been searching for things, nefarious things, and had uh, been able to um, uh, delete or erase those matters from his search history. Uh, of course, this was a, a, a tremendous part of the defense because we were arguing that, we were arguing that there was absolutely no search history whatsoever for anything like, uh, you know, uh, children left in cars, how hot does a car have to be, divorce lawyers. Uh, there, there was nothing like that. There was no search which supported the, uh, the state's suggestion of motive. The, objectively, there just wasn't anything there. However, the state continued to suggest throughout the trial that uh, that they didn't make any difference because Ross was able to get rid of that stuff. Uh, they continued to suggest that 
you know, he, he, he hit it or he erased it somehow. He had the ability to do that. Uh, so just because it's not there doesn't mean he didn't do it. Well, um, this line in here, knowledge of how to erase internet search history, um, at the very least, at the very least, it's, it, it demonstrates that the defense team and the defense expert is concerned about it, is worried about it, is looking into it, is asking about it. Um, and that's absolutely contrary to what our defense was. Uh, our defense was that it ain't there, period. He didn't do any searches like that. It's not there. But now, uh, you know, now after we had to turn this over, the state had a document that demonstrated the attorneys and the expert were worried about that, concerned about it, and had questions about it. Um, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was a real, it was a real dagger. It was a real problem for us. Well, did um, you have concerns about the next line about forgotten baby dog search history? Same thing. I mean, same thing. There, there, had, there was no objective evidence whatsoever that there was any search regarding a forgotten baby, uh, nor anything involving uh, uh, searching for a forgotten dog. The only evidence was that on uh, Ross's Reddit page, um, uh, something, a public service announcement had popped up on his Reddit page, which he had apparently played or at least accessed. But there was no evidence of a search history for anything like that. So again, you know, we had to turn over a document that says, I mean, it's pretty clear. This is something that the attorneys and the expert were concerned about. Um, you know, they've got questions that we're going to ask Ross about uh, information about his uh, search history on these topics, forgotten baby or forgotten dog. Well, I mean, let me ask you this because let me go back up to knowledge of how to race internet search history. There's a question after that. I apologize. I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. Let me get closer. Uh, going back up to the knowledge of how to erase internet search history, there's a question mark after that. Correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and would that indicate to you whether or not it might be something that uh, looking at it, from somebody else's perspective, uh, could it be argued by an attorney? That's a question that y'all were going to ask. Uh, this uh, somebody's going to ask Ross Harris. It, it could be taken a number of ways. I'll, I'll tell you the way we took it was that it's on paper, mm -hmm. and the state could make make it mean whatever they wanted it to mean. Okay. Well, the, down here, more about forgotten baby dog kid search history. There's no question mark. Right. Do you think? Do you think that that could be a statement that uh, somebody could read that as a, a statement about Ross gave them or gave Dr. Diamond more information about the baby and the dog search history? Absolutely. And, uh, is that the, one of the concerns you were talking about? Yes. Okay. All right. We can go forward. A uh, uh, light bulb purchase and. Um, is this something that uh, y'all went over with him? When I say him, I mean Dr. Diamond. Absolutely. Now, was there a video of that as well? Yes. Did y'all show that to Dr. Diamond? Yes. Okay. And um, is that something that uh, in y'all's conversation was very important? It was important during our conversations with Dr. Diamond. Now, uh, go ahead. Um, I, I, it's hard to imagine there was a more hotly contested issue at trial than that um, about him putting light bulbs in, in the car. Um, but yes, we discussed it at great length with uh, Dr. Diamond. We showed him the video um, and uh, I mean, he was very, very engaged um, I mean, he asked us questions, um, and I'm uh, quite certain that he discussed this with Ross. And um, this hypothetical, was, was that a concern for y'all? Absolutely. Explain to me why that was a concern. 
that the state well, would have this uh, document with that um, hypothetical question. Um, so uh, the hypothetical, uh, what if you wanted to leave Cooper in the car intentionally and made it appear it was a memory error? Um, how might you use the internet to carry out the plan and cover your tracks? Well, uh, I mean, that's pretty much, uh, that, that's pretty much the state's theory. Uh, that was their theory. And here we're, we're turning over a document that uh, has got, um, has got that, that very theory in black and white on a piece of paper that uh, now says, well, the lawyers and the expert apparently concerned about this as well. Does it have a follow up after the questions? What? Does it have a follow up after the questions? That, that he couldn't answer the question other than talk techie. Um, I, and so um, I, I now know that that was an answer that um, Ross gave uh, David Diamond. I now know that, uh, which again to me is very clear evidence that, th that these confidential work product notes were um, created over a period of time, not just one city. But yes, it, it was a, um, uh, an, ex an extreme concern to us because I could just imagine in closing argument, um, you know, the state asking these questions, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what if you wanted to leave Cooper in the car intentionally and make it appear it was a memory error? Uh, how would you cover your tracks? You know, Ross Harris couldn't answer that question, but I think it's been answered during this trial. I think that question's been answered during this trial. You know, uh, seems to me if somebody was innocent and that question was posed to them, what they would say is, my God, why are you asking that question? Are you kidding me? Uh, that's outrageous. How dare you? I, I, I can't even imagine. I, I can't even conceive. Of, of such a thing and um, and because it's now on a piece of paper that the state has they can use it uh, as a weapon um, when they cross-examine um, when they cross-examine uh, David Diamond uh, and confront him with that uh, as well as in closing if they wanted to Okay, um, going on down. Now, down here, you have a lot of things about Chick-fil-A. Um, does this tie in with a little bit of what you were talking about earlier about things that you learned and you were having to explore and learn over time? Yes. Tell me how it ties into that. Please. So I think as it relates to Chick-fil-A, we, um, uh, we, we had a lot of information early on, but what, what we did not know early on and we could not pinpoint early on was um, precisely how many times uh, a week Ross would go into the restaurant versus going through the drive-through and precisely how many of those times over a period of a week or a month that he would take Cooper to Chick-fil-A? Would he, would he do it through the drive-through or would he go into the restaurant? And the reason, why, the reason why that was important was because it went to his habit and his change, uh, change of pattern that morning. Um, Ross was not a very good historian of, of he did not have a good recollection of how many times he uh, went to Chick-fil-A and went through the drive-thru or went in or took Cooper. Uh, he's very prone to exaggeration, so much so that we, we just could not, I mean, we couldn't rely on what he was telling us because it was, it was exaggerated. And so it was very painstaking over a period of a year to get information such as credit card receipts, uh, uh, credit card bills, um, all the information that we could gather in order to uh, figure out uh, how many, how often did he go to Chick-fil-A? How often did he go through the drive-through? How often did he go in? 
and uh, how often did he take Cooper? Um, although uh, we never had absolute specifics, um, we certainly narrowed it down much, much, much better than we did early on when these, uh, these notes were uh, discussed with Dr. Diamond. And again, these are, but these are uh, things that y'all were concerned about as part of your strategy and how to address the issues at trial. Yeah, I mean, obviously it definitely, it definitely played into strategy. All right, um, let's go, uh, if we can let's go to the next page, please. Thank you very much. The, uh, the thing up here about Dick and Tex till while driving, I mean, is that something y'all discussed? Yes. And um, was that something that was a, an issue with you guys? Very much so. How so? So the state wanted to, the state wanted to suggest that Ross was texting during the drive from the Chick-fil-A to the treehouse. Uh, that, that was something that, that wanted to suggest. And the reason why was because if Ross was texting during the drive over, you know, that, that would be illegal and it would be reckless and careless. And so um, that would diminish uh, any defense of um, memory failure. Uh, because if his memory failure was based on something he was doing that was illegal or reckless or that he shouldn't have been doing, such as texting while he was driving with a baby in the car, then it, I mean, it totally would destroy the memory failure defense. Um, what we knew early on is that Ross told us he didn't text while driving. That's what he told us. Um, but at the time that we talked to to Dr. Diamond about this, we just did not have, we, we had not gone through all of the evidence sufficient enough to uh, uh, tie the, the timing up to be able to conclusively uh, uh, determine that he was not texting while driving. Now, ultimately, we were pretty confident that the, the digital evidence and the videos from uh, the Home Depot uh, treehouse and the Chick-fil-A, when you kind of put them all together, uh, ultimately we were able to demonstrate, I think pretty conclusively that, uh, you know, he was texting before he left Chick-fil-A and he was texting when he got to Home Depot treehouse, uh, but he was not texting while he was driving. But at the time that we met with Dr. Diamond and this document was created, um, I mean, we all we knew is that Ross told us he didn't text while driving. And so that was something that was uh, was definitely needed to be followed up on. And we did follow up and provided additional information to to the expert. OK, just talk about car seats with Dr. Diamond. Yes. And how did that play into your trial strategy and your, your preparation for trial? Well, the information, the information regarding uh, the timing of what car seat was in which car, when, and when they were changed out, uh, a lot of that information came from conversations with Ross. Um, I mean, ultimately, we were able to confirm a lot of stuff with Leanna Harris uh, and, and actually with some, uh, uh, some other evidence in the case. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, we told Dr. Diamond what we knew at that, at that juncture. Uh, of course, the, the car seat was very important to the issue of uh, Diamond had, had concluded or opined that there was a memory failure uh, and a child was left in a car. Uh, my recollection is, is that they all were rear facing car seats. Okay. All right, and um, the last, well, I won't call it the last section, the second last section where it starts public service announcement. Um, that information, um, do you know if that came from you? 
or, um, or your trial team? So um, I'm confident that as we discuss that, I'm confident that we discuss that very matter with, uh, uh, with David Diamond. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, I mean, he, he, he's not just going to take any case. I mean, he has to rule out that it was intentional. Uh, and, and I know that, um, uh, that there was this uh, nefarious suggestion about that uh, public service announcement about that vet video. And so that was that was something that he asked us a lot of questions about and uh, that that was discussed at quite a quite a length with with uh, Dr. Diamond. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I do not believe that the phrase public service announcement came from anybody but me. Um, that is not the way Ross talks. I don't ever recall him using that particular verbiage. If I'm wrong, uh, I mean, this was a couple of years ago, but but when I reviewed this material, that's really the first thing that jumped out at me is that I, that those are my words. That that's just that's my recollection. And um, these uh, last couple of things down there before you get to the spaces, um, did those come? I mean, did y'all talk about these things about the? Um, the stress of the new pro project, and then also the midnight project timestamp. Yes. Right. Why were those concerns? Well, um, those those were uh, you know in response to what uh, the uh, Dr. Diamond was asking us if there was evidence that Ross was exhausted or under stress. These were uh, these were. Uh, particular things that we picked out and advised him that um, were, you know, could be significant um, evidence of, of either stress or exhaustion. Um, and so, I mean, th those very clearly were matters that were important to the defense. Uh, I don't think they were important at all to the state, but they were, they, they were important to us. And uh, of course, we were looking for witnesses uh, and evidence to, um, uh, you know, to establish those facts. Mr. Durham. Yes, ma'am. How much? How many more questions do you think you have? How much time? Uh, it's going to be a little bit longer. As far as this specific exhibit, I've okay. got maybe one more question, but we have a whole other issue as far as trial strategy about the statement. So. Why don't you finish up on this exhibit, then we'll take a comfort break for the afternoon. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, okay, Maddox, the, from the video uh, parked in the shade, is that something um, that y'all were concerned with or it talked about? Uh, that was very that was very much an issue that was uh, part of the defense. Very much an issue that was part of the defense. Um, so much so that um, I believe very early on, we let Dr. Diamond know that we had a video of, of precisely where in the parking lot that Ross had parked. Um, because again, the state, the state was uh, suggesting that Ross had intentionally left his child in the car uh, to, to, to die in a hot car, when in fact, uh, we had evidence early on that the, uh, the the parking lot was a very large parking lot, and he could have very easily uh, put that car in very um, more isolated uh, places in the parking lot where nobody would have walked by the car. Uh, not only that, there were very, very few trees in the middle of that parking lot, and we noticed that where he parked was not only in the middle of a lot, but it was under the shade of a tree, um, which of course is contrary to the suggestion that somehow he was intentionally parking in a way to, to uh, bake his child in the car. So uh, early on, we went over that with Dr. Diamond um, so that he, um, uh, he would understand what that evidence was and how it was inconsistent with this, um, uh, the state's suggestion of uh, malice or intent. Okay, thank you. Judge, that's all for this, this particular exhibit. All right, let's break for, um, till 10 after three. Thank you.
Do you want to text Mr. Jerome and tell him I'm back? There he is. Perfect timing. Unmute. Sorry, yes, I, I didn't see everybody there, so. <laughs> oh, I'm not passing. Like, oh, I know, but I just was just scrambling for this button, so. No, 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 that's not necessary. I'm sure you were in and out looking for us. I had to step down to Judge Leonard's office for a minute, so I apologize, I was a little light. Sorry, God. Hmm? Are we, uh, yeah, I was not going to need the break, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I took one. All right, it looks like we can resume. Is that fair to say? Is the court reporter back? She is. I love that thumbs up. Mr. Durham, resume the examination of Mr. Kilgore. Okay. If we could put up, um, I think this is going to be D2, please. Okay. Um, Mr. Kilgore. Yes. Uh, do you recognize uh, what's uh, shown on the screen is uh, the first page of uh, D2. Yes. All right, could you scroll to the next page, please? And do you recognize that as well? Yes. And roll one more time. And do you recognize that as well? Yes. What is D, uh, D2? And you can take the screen down now. Those are, that, that's, a, that's work product of David Diamond. Okay, and you can take the screen down now. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, you say it's work product, a little more specific. I mean, how did, uh, do you know what it physically is? Uh, yes, he provided it to me. Um, uh, he provided it to me when I asked him, um, when I explained the court's order of what we had to turn over. Uh, okay. and that was uh, one of the documents he provided to me that um, he indicated was um, uh, notes that he used in, uh, in preparation to talk to Ross Harris. Okay, and... Um... Now, the um, and did, did he also provide you the other three documents that were in D one earlier? Yes, sir. Were they all those, those six pages total? Those six pages total were uh, uh, were the six pages that I turned over um, as a result of the court's order on the state's motion to compel. Uh, in okay. my pleading, uh, in my pleading where I turned those documents over, uh, I did not attach a copy of those six pages because I did not want them to become public record. In fact, I made a note in the pleading that the record would be supplemented by a thumb drive at a later date. Um, I made you aware of that, and you advised me that I did not need to supplement the record because those pages would be identified during the motion for new trial hearing. Okay. And uh, they have been done, but also, uh, let's take back uh, back to the trial of the case. 
Um, do you remember anything going on in the trial where um, there was a discussion um, about how the notes were going to be uh, utilized by the state after you had provided them? Uh, do you mean discussion between the lawyers? Uh, on the record, actually, uh, in court. Right. I just recall there was something on the record that the state suggested that they had done their own in-camera inspection. That somebody in the Brunswick DA's office had looked at the documents and decided that whatever was on the written pages uh, wasn't anything they needed. So they were going to put them in an envelope or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, but you do know that um, it was made part of the record, I guess, then that the state was using the typewritten notes. The, the state yep. that's prosecuting the, uh, the prosecution team that is doing the trial. Yes, we were very aware that the prosecutors in State versus Ross Harris had those confidential work product notes between us and the expert. And um, okay, so um, if you had not um, turned those notes over, would you have uh, been inclined to call Dr. Diamond? We would have called him. Okay. Now, did you talk to Dr. Diamond um, at all about? Him not testifying? Yes, we did. Did you give him reasons why he didn't test? Why, why y'all were not going to call him? Yes, we did. What were those reasons? We gave him all, all kinds of reasons, it's my recollection. Um, so he was very hurt. Um, um, he, I believe that he took it very personally. And he was very hurt, and uh, we 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 meaning me. I tried to explain to him that um, you know uh, he he was going to be subject to cross examination with those notes in a manner which there was nothing I could do about it, and the state was going to be able to um, make those notes say whatever the state wanted them to say. Uh, they were going to be able to use those notes to put words in Ross Harris's mouth. And right. regardless, regardless, I I'm sorry. I just, okay, I was going to ask, but you, you mentioned you gave him several reasons. You gave him other reasons as well. Yes. Okay. All right. And, uh, and you said he was hurt. Uh, his feeling, I mean, he's, he, your, your testimony just then was he, he was uh, hurt and kind of took it personally when y'all told him you weren't going to go have him testify. Yes. Um, that's true. Okay. All right. What other reasons did you give him? Um, I distinctly recall uh, telling him that um, the court had uh, ruled against us on um, matters of law that we believed were contrary to law okay. and that should he take the stand the state could always object to him giving uh, his opinion in regards to in regards to uh, other uh, similar cases he had worked on. Um, okay. And did you, uh, I'm I'm what sorry. And did you uh, did you ever tell him that you know, you know y'all thought because you know did you ever tell him y'all thought things were going okay? and that he wouldn't be needed. I'm sure that we did. I'm going to be honest. We tried to let him down easy. And, and I, I, I think we, I think there were a number of things that we told him to, uh, to, to try to be a salve to his very obviously hurt feelings. Uh, he'd been working on this case for over a year, and um, I mean, we we 
we probably told them lots of things. Okay. All right. Well, now let's go back to um, Ken. Your next prong. You, you told us earlier that you had two two primary focuses on this trial. Do you recall that? Yes. And. Um, No, let, me, let me go back a little bit more about the, the, the notes and things. The, the, the uh, PowerPoint, um, let's talk about that for a bit. Now, um, when you, you, you all had a PowerPoint uh, that you gave the state early on. Yes. And, but that was before Dr. Diamond even had an opportunity to talk to, to Ross, is that correct? That's my rec. Uh, um... We gave the state a PowerPoint early on whether or not that was before or after he talked to Ross, I just can't recall specifically. All right. Now, the, um, I think you had mentioned earlier that the case was uh, just evolving in such a manner that it was, it was a slower evolving case. Uh, did that have any play in the PowerPoint issue? Well, of course, as, um, as, we, we obtained more information uh, and more evidence and so sort of solidified what the defense was gonna be. Uh, we would pass that information along to uh, David Diamond. And he, um, uh, it was up to him whether he was gonna incorporate that into his PowerPoint or not. Uh, but, but let me also point out, uh, please, that David Diamond was um, an expert in lots of cases of, um, um, you know, where, where there was memory failure and a child was left in a car. And over the course of the time that he was involved in our case, he was involved in lots of other cases. And he also spoke uh, at, uh, you know, in academic settings and in legislatures. And um, I, I think that his PowerPoint evolved over the course of over the course of this case, but just simply because of the work that he was doing in this field. Okay. Now, um, you um, did what did you disclose to the state about Dr. David Dines? They they received a uh, his CV. Uh, we also filed a, I think it's a two paragraph statement on uh, the subject matter that the expert would be giving testimony on. We gave them PowerPoints. Okay, and uh, well, I guess in the CV was his contact information so they could call him. Yes, we provided his address and contact information, which of course the state already had because the state had tried to hire him before he came to work for us. Okay. All right. And then um, when you um, turned this material over to the state, uh, did you, um, did Dr. Diamond do any um, scientific reports? No. Any testing? Had to hire him before he came to work for us. Okay. All right. And then um, when you um, turned this material over to the state, uh, did you, um, did Dr. Diamond do any um, scientific reports? No. Any testing? No. Okay. Did he, um, were y'all presenting any mental health? Um... Defenses and competency or anything like that? No.
do you, uh, is there anything that you felt under the law that you should have provided them that you did not? I think I think if anything, we probably we, the answer to question is no, no. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the uh, um, PowerPoint is it? What was your position on having to give the state the PowerPoint, and giving it to in the middle of the trial or near the end of the trial? Well. The, the PowerPoint was a demonstrative aid. It was simply a, um, it, it, it was a series of slides, which was going to aid the witness in his testimony. It was not going to be admitted as a, a piece of substantive evidence, um, like the, uh, like the uh, digital recreation that the state did. Uh, I mean, this was simply some 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 slides that were going to aid the testimony of of the witness, and um, so, so it's certainly not uncommon for those that type of um, demonstrative aid to be uh, amended, updated as a case goes along, and as you get you know as you get closer to trial, and you know when the witness gave us the demonstrative aid. We turned it over to the state. We gave it to them so that they would have an opportunity to go ahead and, um, you know, see what objections they were going to have. And you did that before uh, you put up Dr. Brewer, before you uh, told Dr. Diamond that he was not going to testify. Yes. Okay. Now okay. And the uh, motion to uh, the order. I must compel. If it was, uh, I told you it was August 29th, but it was uh, filed. Did that sound about right? Uh, that sounds right. Do you mind speaking up a little bit? I'll, I'll try to scoot closer. Yeah, I'll try to. <clears throat> uh, I don't think I've talked this much in, in, in a year. So, <laughs> all right. Um, Sorry. If we um, <clears throat> now, I'd like to go to. Uh, the second prong of your defense that we have been talking about. You mentioned the, the state's theory of the case and motive earlier. Tell me about uh, what the, the motive part of that. What was, uh, what was the state's motive in this case? Well, the state, the state's was suggesting that Ross wanted to live uh, child free to pursue extramarital sexual liaisons and that he uh, tortured and murdered his child so that he could um, live child free. Okay. And that was, we mentioned briefly earlier about some of the motions that you filed in the case and um, was that part of trying to uh, attack maybe the motive issue in the case? We did. Um, we were laser focused on challenging the credibility of the police, the police officers and the experts in order to undermine what we believed was a contrived and trumped up motive. Okay. Now there was a, um, an, uh, a, a Reddit or something like that that was uh, discussed uh, where um, Ross had replied to something. Do you know what I'm uh, referring to that kind of the state was using as part of the motive uh, basis? So there was a couple there. I mean, there were there was a lot of uh, social media evidence in the case, but the one that was very, very problematic was a um, 
uh, was an image that I, I want to say was on, it may have been on Whisper that says, uh, I hate being married with kids. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Uh, that was the one that I'm referring it, to, yes. Sir. Okay. I, my recollection is that that was an image that was uh, pulled off of Whisper, the Whisper app social media app um and R ross did not type that he did he that's that's not that those were not his words uh but of course the uh, uh the state my recollection is they blew that up and used it uh to uh, suggest motive um because he responded to that he responded to that social media post and his response was, uh, I love my son and all, but we all need escapes uh, or something of that nature. Of course, um, uh, that Ross's response, of course, was benign um, and true. Any parent, uh, uh, any parent of a child uh, uh, needs to needs to get away from time to time. Um, but but that was uh, that was something that uh, that that was a piece of evidence that we we fought against a, um, a, a false suggestion that it was nefarious and uh, indicative of intent to kill. And uh, you, you mentioned it being what you considered a false uh, narrative. How were you going to attack that? What did y'all determine the best way to try to attack that? Well, the uh, police department gave us plenty of ammunition. Uh, and it started early on with the it started early on with the search warrants that the uh, uh, police, uh, the affidavits that the Cobb County Police Department uh, swore to the magistrate uh, court of Cobb County, swore to magistrate judge um, over and over and over the um, uh, Cobb police detectives uh, gave false testimony, lies. They lied to the magistrate judge. And, uh, um, you know, our, our belief was that was objective evidence uh, because it was in writing. And uh, in fact, in opening statement, we actually put up on the screen some specific language that was used in some of the uh, search warrant applications. Um, In opening statement, we put up on a screen um, one of the one of the warrant application or several of the warrant applications said during the interview with Justin, he stated that he recently researched through the internet child deaths inside vehicles and what temperature it needs to be for that to occur. Um, there was also oral testimony given that uh, he made statements regarding that he had researched how long it takes someone to die inside a vehicle and what temperature it needs to be. Um, there was a whole bunch of whole bunch of stuff in the in the search warrant affidavits that law enforcement swore to that detectives swore to under oath in this case. And um, uh, we felt that was the biggest, best and strongest evidence to demonstrate that the police in this case were willing to lie under oath fly under oath to a judge uh, to turn turn the narrative in their favor um, to to to, um, uh, to concoct to concoct this motive um, it, you know in addition to the search warrant affidavits there was also uh, a lot of false testimony that was given in the probable cause hearing um, that was given by Detective Stoddard, and um, we were able to cross-examine Detective Stoddard about uh, his prior testimony. So that um, that we brought out an opening, and we got to we got to challenge the credibility of law enforcement uh, uh, regarding the regarding the uh, false testimony during the uh, probable cause hearing. But the search warrants, the the affidavits, the false testimony under oath. We were not allowed to go into. Okay, so um, when you're talking about the, um, the search warrant issue now, how were you um, planning on trying to attack that? 
procedurally, I guess. Well, we wanted to question the detectives about it. Well, we'll start with which detective did you want to uh, testify? Well, we attempted to cross-examine the case agent about it, the, uh, the lead detective who was uh, Detective Stoddard. Uh, he was the one who um, he was the one who had conducted the interview with Ross, uh, and obviously had full knowledge that there were, uh, that the magistrate court was lied to. Okay. And, um, there was, uh, another, was there any other, um, uh, pe people you want to talk to about those specific search warrant issues? Well, the, the state objected to, uh, any examination of Detective Stoddard about the uh, false testimony uh, uh, under oath for those warrants. And um, we had a bench conference and uh, the uh, prosecutor, um, you know, the prosecutor told the judge, if you, um, uh, you know, if you get the right detective, basically, if you get Detective um, uh, Murphy, then it won't be hearsay. And so we said, okay. So we, we made arrangements to get Detective Murphy down. I, uh, I told the judge, I said, well, we'll call him. We'll call him as a witness. And so arrangements were made to get Detective Murphy down to, the, um, to Brunswick. He got down there and um, took the stand. And in between the bench conference and the officer actually taking the stand, the state had decided that, well, maybe it was hearsay. And so they completely changed, completely changed what they were telling the court. And we were not allowed to question Detective Murphy about testimony he gave under oath uh, in this case um, to a magistrate judge over and over and over. False testimony. Okay. All right. As far as Detective Murphy, that was going to be... Um... T. Brian Lumpkin was going to do that testimony, correct? That, that questioning. So we had, um, based based on the based on the things that we were individually working on toward the end of trial, uh, it was decided that uh, uh, Brian Lumpkin was going to handle Detective Murphy, and um, I, I can't remember specifically why we made that decision. Um, I think some of it had to do with the fact that, um, first of all, Brian is very, very good, and he had uh, essentially destroyed a state's witness earlier in the case. That was um, uh, Grimstead, who was a. Uh, I, I just I want you to uh, answer just as far as the question was: Was uh, Brian Lumpkin going to uh, question Murphy? I'm going, to yes. go into the, I'm going to go into the other witnesses in a second now. You mentioned Dunstan um, and uh, Grimstead. Now, um, there were, a while ago, you also mentioned the recreation or 3D animation and um, that y'all had objected to at trial, and it uh, was allowed in over objection. Did you, um, was, that, uh, was that part of the plan to attack the state's case was to go after the recreation as well? Uh, very much so. Okay. And that was going to be done. Uh, that questioning was done partly by um, uh, T. Brian Lumpkin, but also by um, Carlos Rodriguez. Uh, my recollection is that Carlos Rodriguez cross examined uh, David Dustin, who was the uh, Pharaoh. Um, he was the witness that they used to get that piece of evidence in. Okay. And uh, so then we go to. Um, but they're part of the trial team and they're part of the strategy of all working together on this defense theory about how to try to protect the state's case and the credibility of their evidence and their testimony. Is that fair? Absolutely. Now, um, there was another state's expert um, that uh, testified named uh, Jim Persinger. Do you recall his testimony? Yes, I do. And it was the same theory going to be used in trying to confront uh, Persinger's testimony? Absolutely. We were going to challenge his uh, credibility and attack his credibility. And um, 
and I will tell you during his direct examination, we were, we, we just got a gift that fell in our lap, which was the, uh, the witness uh, put on this charade in front of the jury where he, he, he clearly didn't know what he was talking about. And, um, um, and uh, it, I mean, it just basically was a gift. It just fell in our lap. And we had, we had an opportunity to um, essentially destroy the credibility of this. I mean, this was their primary main expert for the state of Georgia. And we had a chance to destroy his credibility in front of the jury, um, uh, completely destroy him. And, uh, and the state uh, objected. Um, was, let me just cut you off, but was this uh, done by a different attorney? Was this Carlos Rodriguez's witness? Yes. Okay. And so, uh, but that was also part of your strategy in, in attacking the state's case was to go after this witness and his credibility and what he had done or not done. Yes, of course. All right. uh, and, yes. and, and I was the one that was giving closing arguments. So, uh, all of the challenges that uh, to credibility during the trial of the case were going to be things that I either could or could not use in closing argument. And y'all were talking about that, what you needed to do and what you were trying to do. To Absolutely. And uh, you gave the opening statement as well, did you not? Yes. And a lot of the things we've talked about up to this point, you presented an opening statement because you were, um, let me rephrase that. Why did you present an open statement? Why did I give an opening statement? Oh, no. Why did you present these issues in opening statement? The issues you talked about as far as when you're going to attack the police credibility on the affidavits and the false testimony at the PC hearing and all these other things. Did you think it was important to your case? It, it was extraordinarily important. Uh, I, I will say again, there, there was an allegation of a, of, a, of a baby that died in a horrible way, and it was alleged that the father did it intentionally, and there was a mountain of bad character evidence, uh, so uh, we, we were very much starting in, in a hole. Uh, we could put up all of the uh, accident, memory failure evidence in the world, but unless we uh, unless we demonstrated conclusively that the, uh, the state's witnesses were liars and were not credible uh, and had concocted and contrived this motive, uh, unless we could do that, um, we just, uh, we knew we were going to be in trouble. And so it was a concerted effort with every witness, not just the defense witnesses, but uh, to attack the state's witnesses specifically to show they were not credible. And when you <clears throat> when you talked about this um, this evidence uh, in the opening statement, did you tell the jury you're going to see this in the evidence? You're going to see this, and you promised them that these things were going to come out. Well, I definitely promised them that they were going to uh, see where the Cobb police detective uh, lied to a magistrate judge um, uh, under oath to. Um, uh, to obtain search warrants, and um, uh, I was, and obviously, um, I did not fulfill that promise um, because I was. We were not allowed to. We were not allowed to uh, question the witness about his uh, false testimony under oath. And did you have any question in your mind legally that you would not be able or would be able to get into that testimony? Zero. It's zero. Zero what? We had, there was no question at all, ever, ever in our minds that we would not be allowed to uh, question a law enforcement officer who had given false testimony under oath in this very case about evidence which was in the case. Um. You mentioned one, let's go back to the specifics of here. You mentioned one uh, witness that you were cross-examining uh, and that would be Detective Stoddard. Is that right? Right. 
All right, to talk to me about, uh, talk to us again about how you tried to approach it with the Detective Stoddard. How I tried to if, approach him? Uh, approach the issue regarding the search warrants with Detective Stoddard. So uh, Stoddard testified over a couple of days and uh, we used him to, to get a lot of different information out, but we definitely challenged uh, his veracity and his credibility uh, when we pointed out specific false testimony he gave under oath at the probable cause hearing. And, uh, and then we sort of a, a transitioned into, was gonna uh, asking him if he was aware about uh, additional false testimony that was given under oath in the case. Um, and of course I was gonna go into the uh, uh, false testimony for the search warrants. And uh, that's when the state objected and we had a bench conference. Okay, and when you did that, I mean, were you, what was, you, you mentioned the purpose, but I wanna be clear, was the purpose to relitigate the search warrant issue? Uh, was it to attack the credibility or was it both? What was it? What was the purpose? It was, so, it was solely to challenge the credibility of, of the uh, police department and show that they were willing to lie under oath in this case to, uh, uh, to so the evidence would fit their narrative and fit their uh, contrived trumped up motive. We absolutely did not uh, uh, intend to relitigate the search warrant. There was no reason to. All of the evidence was already in the case. Uh, everything, everything that was challenged earlier regarding the um, search warrant, um, it had already been admitted. It was already in, in the trial. There, there wasn't any reason for us to try to relitigate the search warrant itself. Uh, we were going after the we were going after the credibility of the state by going after the credibility of their law enforcement officer who was willing to lie to a judge. Okay. And uh, so you weren't able to do that. And I mean, think again, you mentioned uh, that you had the bench conference and, and called uh, Detective um, Murphy as a result of that. Yes. Okay. Give me one second, Judge, please. Yeah. Anything else? Hang one second. All right, let me uh, ask you just a couple more things. Um, um, Mr. Cooper, you mentioned early on about the um, child-free lifestyle, but uh, what was that, what were you referring to there? Well, uh, that, was, um, that was both regarding a specific piece of evidence and the bigger picture of the state's theory of the case and the state's motive. The bigger picture was the state was suggesting that Ross wanted to live child free so he, that he could, you know, pursue extramarital relations. Um, but there was specific evidence regarding a direct message chat uh, between Ross and uh, some of his friends, particularly his friend Alex where Alex forwarded him some link, uh, I believe it was a Reddit link to a uh, kind of a subreddit group called Child Free, uh, which uh, purports to be a group of individuals who, who want to live a life without children. And uh, early on in the case, the, um, uh, the state um, knew about this evidence very, very early uh, because they brought it out uh, uh, very disingenuously and falsely in the probable cause hearing 
uh, and made the suggestion that this was something that Ross had subscribed to, when in fact, when we finally found the evidence uh, and looked at it, uh, it was all a lie. In fact, Ross had responded to his colleagues, uh, um, his colleagues' uh, direct message with the word grossness, which to us was pretty clear that it was not something that Ross subscribed to. Um, but we, we, but that's the only place in the evidence that 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 um, uh, child-free. Um, I mean, that was that's where it was. And now, um, one more, got two or three more questions, but I want to go back to, as far as the purpose of you uh, asking the questions regarding the search warrant and um, questioning uh, the witnesses in that regard uh, and the state's witnesses. I mean, was that to show any bias, any motive? What was, the, what was, are you doing the search warrants? I, uh, I try to relitigate those. I don't know if I've asked that, but I want to make sure I got that clear. Uh, was it for the bias motive? Was it for search warrant? Was it for any other reason? So, uh, so M Mr. Durham, I apologize. You went out. Uh, do you mind restating that question, sir? Sure. Uh, I just want to make sure I, we, we've been talking a lot. I want to make sure I have this correct, but now, when you're at, when you're trying to cross-examine Detective Stoddard, and, it's, and also with uh, Detective Murphy, um, and you're going after the search warrant issues, now um, was the purpose of that for the bias and motive? Was it for trying to attack their credibility in that regard? Was it for to um, show prior inconsistent statements, or both? All, all, all of the above. All of the above. And, and frankly, we're we're using. We're using the phrase search warrant because that was the context in which the false testimony was given. The context doesn't matter. What mattered to us was this was sworn testimony under oath uh, about this case by a detective in this case. And I, and I went over with Detective Stoddard at great length, all of the different for pages, all of the different uh, responsibilities that Detective Murphy had. Detective Murphy was no bystander in this case. He was intimately involved in, uh, uh, in the investigation of this case from, the, from day one, intimately involved. And... Um, uh, okay, and so um, lastly, the... Um, you filed a motion for new trial in this case. Yes. Okay. One of the issues, I just want to make sure we're clear here on the record. Um, you had talked about the um, the bias, uh, excuse, bias, I'm sorry, the um, the bad character evidence and um, uh, of that nature. Now you listed three uh, three examples in your uh, in the motion for new trial filed on behalf of Ross Harris. Do you recall that? Yes. Now, um, there is no, uh, were you, was your intent just to do it for those three people or you, uh, was that for everybody? You just use those as an example or how, how did that come about? Those were just examples. We, we objected uh, uh, pre-trial to all of the uh, mountain and cavalcade of uh, bad character evidence, which didn't have anything to do with the underlying charges. Without going into a lot of detail, just, to, just the question would be, the uh, witnesses came in and they talked about graphic language and text and photos and things like this. Is that uh, is, is what the, the character witnesses are talking about? Yes. Well, did they um, did that information also get relayed to um, other witnesses at trial uh, back in front of the jury again? For example, if you brought up a carry, if you brought up a witness, were they also informed about those bad acts in front of the jury again? Uh, of course, um, the the the. I mean, it seemed like every. It seemed to us like every witness that took the stand, uh, the state wanted to uh, relitigate the bad character by showing pictures of Ross's privates or calling attention to the fact that Ross had. Uh, you know, done done these morally uh, uh, morally uh, inappropriate uh, behavior. I think that's all. Just time, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Kilborn. Cross-examine. 
Thank you, Judge. All right, Mr. Kilgore. Um, you've done a number of murder trials, is that correct? I have tried murder cases. As both a prosecutor and as a defense attorney? Yes, ma'am. This particular case, did you feel you had enough time to prepare this case to go to trial? Yes, ma'am. And you met repeatedly with Mr. Harris, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And it's obvious that you really focused in on a two-prong defense strategy, is that correct? That's fair. All right, and the first prong was accident, um, which is an affirmative defense that has to be disproven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and part of your strategy there in trying to prove it's accident is to explain how it was accident by putting up an expert such as Dr. Jean Brewer to explain prospective memory and how someone could potentially have an error in memory and therefore forget their kid in the car. Yes, ma'am. All right. And the second strategy was to attack law enforcement and their credibility. Is that correct? Yes. And the reason to attack the credibility of law enforcement and the detectives in this case was to undermine this idea that there was in fact a motive and a reason for Mr. Harris to have murdered his child. Yes. And have you used attacking law enforcement's credibility as a strategy in the past? Never anything like this. I have never, uh, in my almost 30 years of practice, I have never been involved in any case which there was uh, so clearly um, uh, incredible evidence, uh, where there was so much evidence against the uh, credibility and veracity of law enforcement. Nothing, anything like this ever in my career. What I asked was, have you ever used this as a strategy in a case before? Um, uh, as we speak right now, uh, I, I cannot specifically recall that uh, challenging the credibility uh, of the veracity of a law enforcement officer was such a primary part of the defense. Uh, but in a general sense, um, uh, it, it is certainly something that that uh, is common uh, that we do is to is to challenge the credibility of police officers. And you do that through cross examination, showing that they may have made an error in the statement in their report, um, that they didn't do something that they should have done, um, things along those lines, or that they lied under oath. And. It was not in dispute that your client had left Cooper Harris in his car. Of course right. not. And it was not in dispute that Cooper Harris died because he was left in the car. Of course not. And so therefore the main issue at trial was the first prong of your defense. Was it an accident or was it intentional? That was the legal uh, component uh, that was the legal basis of the defense was uh, that it was an accident because of a memory failure. Right. And the police interviewed Mr. Harris, is that correct? Yes. Was that shown to the jury? Yes. And at that time, he said it was an accident? Yes. And would you agree that a number of the things that your client told the police during that interview were things he also reiterated to Dr. Diamond and Dr. Diamond wrote those things in his notes. Uh, I would, Did it freeze? No, I think Mr. Kilgore is looking at his notes. Okay. Um, so I, my, my response would be um, there were things that, that Ross Harris uh, told the detective in the interview that the lawyers conveyed to um, Dr. Diamond. Okay. But I thought you said that Dr. Diamond actually was given Mr. Harris's interview to watch as well. He was. Okay. And I guess what I was asking is, did Dr. Diamond then follow up with Mr. Harris about topics that Mr. Harris had already talked to the police about? 
uh, presumably he would he would have. Uh, but I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is in these notes that were turned over, uh, what is being conveyed to Dr. Diamond is clearly being conveyed by the lawyers. I mean, he what these are these are notes from our conversation with him, which he used as a go by to then go and talk to Ross. I understand. All right. Um, and I just, and this is just for the record, I know these are a series of silly questions, just go with me. You would agree that my name is Linda Dunikoski and that I'm not Chuck Boring, Susan Treadway, or Jesse Evans, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, and I didn't try this case, did I? No, ma'am. I'm just the appellate attorney, correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. And today is December 14th of 2020, correct? Yes, ma'am. And we're not in Brunswick, Georgia, are we? No, ma'am. Right. And you filed a lot of motions in this case. Um, I think we got up to motion number 28. Is that correct? Well, uh, we didn't file as many as you'd have in a death penalty case, but we, we certainly filed uh, over 20. And there were seven different days of motions for motions hearings, right? Uh, there were multiple days of motions hearings. And your team put up numerous witnesses on Mr. Harris's behalf. Is that correct during trial? Yes, ma'am. And one of those witnesses was Dr. Jean Brewer, correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. And part of your trial strategy, I believe, um, during opening and closing was that you urged the jury to completely disregard the state's motive evidence. Is that right? Um, I'm certain that we did. Well, that was one of your main strategies, right? That you can't believe this motive ev evidence, right? Yes. And your team did everything to conduct thorough and sifting cross-examinations of the state's witnesses, correct? We did everything that we were permitted to do. Okay. And sometimes a lot of attorneys go into court attempting to put certain evidence before the jury, and sometimes the court will rule against them. That happens, right? Sometimes the court is correct. Sometimes the court is not correct. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about timing issues. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, transition now into um, the ineffective assistance of counsel of claim one, which is the failure to call Dr. Diamond to testify. Um, so first off, I believe you testified earlier that the whole point of calling Dr. Diamond was to have him opine that this case was in fact a case of memory failure and that he was gonna be able to compare other cases to this case where children were forgotten in a car and that he was absolutely going to have to disprove that this was intentional. Is that correct? So you, you've asked us a couple of questions there. I'm going I'm to ask you to break that down for me, please. Sure. The whole point of calling Dr. Diamond was to put him on the stand to opine two things. It wasn't intentional. It was a failure of memory systems, right? Those were two of the reasons, uh, two of the um, significant matters that we certainly wanted to get from Dr. Diamond but it was in no way the entirety of what we expected or wanted to get from him. And you worked with Dr. Diamond on the strategy of your case, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you provided him with the evidence from the state? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the evidence in this case came from the state and it was given to you, the defense attorneys who then handed it over to Dr. Diamond, correct? course. All right. And the state strategy in this case, or rather the evidence was not a big giant secret, was it? It was obvious that the state had indicted your client and was claiming that he intentionally put his child in this car. Um, so um, as it, very generally, that is true. That is what the state uh, suggested happened. All right. But what I'm getting at is the state didn't try and play hide the ball with what it was doing. The state put it out there. We've indicted him. He murdered his child. These are the charges. And here's the evidence and handed it over to you. Right. Well, that, that's no different than any other case. All right. And you talked with Dr. Diamond about your opinions about the evidence. Is that correct? 
At length. And about your strategy in the case. At length. So Dr. Diamond was not an impartial expert. Well, um, he was uh, he was in a position to give an opinion or opinions plural, which supported the uh, which supported the defense theory. So uh, in in that regard, he, he was favorable for the defense, or he would have been favorable for the defense. And what he had to say would have been contrary to the uh, state's theory. So do you recall, well, have you had an opportunity to review your opening statement? Yes. All right. And do you recall that in your opening statement, you didn't actually name any expert by name. You just said you're going to hear. And then you kind of laid out what prospective memory was and what memory failure was. That's true. And have you spoken to Dr. Diamond since 2016? I think we may have exchanged an email about three years ago. Um, I, I think at some point over the last four years, we may have touched base. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we became fairly close working together over a year, year and a half. Right. And so I believe you testified, I just want to be, make, make sure I got this right, that you believe Dr. Diamond was going to be able to take the stand and say that his opinion was this case is a result of a failure of memory systems. So I, I want to make real clear what my testimony is in this regard. If, if said, um, uh, I, I doubt very seriously that Mr. Boring would have asked that specific question to Dr. Diamond because that probably goes to the ultimate issue. So if Dr. Diamond would have testified, uh, he, he, uh, it, it, we would have phrased the questions to him um, uh, more along the line of, so the, what, what you observed and evaluated in this case, uh, was it consistent <laughs> with what you know uh, about um, memory failure. Was this case consistent with your study of memory failure? Uh, but we would have taken it further and said, was what you learned in this case, what you observed in this case, was it consistent with other cases you've worked on and studied and been involved in where it was determined to be a memory failure where uh, a child was left in a car? Uh, because you see, Dr. Diamond had, uh, again, he, he did forensic work. He was actually hands-on working on these cases. And so I, I certainly believe he would have had every right to uh, give that opinion that, uh, that uh, what he saw in this case was certainly consistent with other cases he'd worked on involving memory failure and been able to give specifics about what uh, facts or characteristics were similar. Wouldn't the state, in your opinion, wouldn't the state have objected to that testimony, given he's basically saying, well, Susie shoplifted in this manner, so therefore Janet had to have shoplifted. It wasn't accidental that she put it in her purse because Susie did it this way. And wouldn't the state have objected to that sort of testimony? So we're talking about the testimony of an expert who is giving his opinion based on uh, all of his work all of his study, uh, and his study is studying these very cases. Um, so I, I, I think that it's certainly within the, um, uh, certainly within the realm of the expert to give that very testimony. But, but to answer your question, Ms. Dunkowski, uh, I, I think the state was going to object to everything as they did throughout the entire trial. Anything, anything they didn't want the jury to hear, they were going to come up with some sort of objection hearsay, foundation, whatever. So yeah, they were probably gonna object. Okay. And I believe you previously testified that one of the reasons you were, when you were talking to Dr. Diamond and telling him one of the reasons we didn't put you on the stand was that the state's basically probably gonna object that this opinion where he compares other cases where other people did things to this case 
that that would be objected to and there'd be a ruling and the ruling might not go favorably. Um, I, I don't remember the exact words, but um, that was certainly the kind of stuff that we were talking to him about. All right, so when we get back to um, the ultimate issue. So you clearly understood the court's ruling when the court ruled, um, I believe on August 29th of 2016, right prior to trial, that no expert could go into the ultimate issue under rule 704. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. Well, under rule 704, I don't have the order in front of me. Allow me to share my screen with you. Okay. And I want to, and I don't have the statute in front of me either. Um, uh, this was not a mental health expert. I mean, um, yeah, I understand that very clearly. Okay. So, and just for the record, if you don't mind, could you just basically start right here with fines? Okay. I'm sorry, I was unclear. Could you read it out loud for the record? Finds that testimony by defense expert, Dr. David Diamond, as to the ultimate issue regarding the defendant's intent to commit the crime or lack thereof, defendant's mental state or mental condition constituting an element of the offense or defense thereto, or defendant's mens rea would be inadmissible and inappropriate. And what section and statute does the court cite then? 24-7-704. Okay. And you just read from which order? Whatever you showed me. Order on state's motion in limine to exclude expert opinion on the ultimate issue. And what date was that issue? August 29, 2016. Okay. So you were well aware of this before you started trial. Um, on September 12th, 2016, that Dr. Diamond was not going to be able to opine in any way, shape or form that Ross Harris's actions were either intentional or a result of memory system. And, and because of that, it was uh, certainly our intention to pose questions in the form of whether or not uh, what he observed was consistent with uh, his study of memory failure. All right. Now, with regard to the state's motion to compel, the state, um, well, first off, the defense filed uh, the defense discovery on the state on April 6th. I apologize, April 4th, 2016. Is that correct? I don't have any idea. If you say so, I mean, the record should show whatever date we, we filed things. And do you recall uh, filing with that? Um, I'm looking for my, there we go. Filing with that certificate of discovery, uh, the CV of Dr. David Diamond? Uh, we, we definitely provided that to, we definitely provided that to the state. All right, and you mentioned, I think the two paragraph summary at that time. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna have you take a look for me at state's exhibit S1. And we have a 47 page document. Um, does this look familiar as the CV of Dr. David Diamond that you provided the state with on April 4th, 2016? Uh, as far as I know, At this time, the state would tender in state's exhibit number one. Any objection? Mitch, there. Sorry, uh, Your Honor, I could, with the shared screen, I could not locate the mute. Um, it was covered oh. up. Oh, no. Okay. But we have no objection. It's admitted. Right. And then 
Mr. Kilgore, I'm going to have you take a look at then states exhibit number two. And does this look familiar to you as the disclosure to state's council of summary of expert testimony that you served on the state on April 4th, 2016? So br bring it, bring it all the way down so I can see the whole document, please. Sure thing. Keep okay. going, please. No problem. Just let me know. Keep all the way to the bottom. Yes, it, it looks like, uh, it looks like something we provided. Okay. And when we see page one, Dr. David Diamond with the CV attached, is this the two paragraph summary that you provided to the state as to what he was gonna to testify to? Uh, yes. At this time, the state would tender into evidence state's exhibit S2. No objection. Admitted. Right. And so obviously before the court's ruling on August 29th of 2016, you have here that Dr. Diamond is anticipated to provide expert opinion that defendant's failure to take Cooper Harris to daycare was not intentional, but a failure of memory systems. Is that correct? That's what's typed. Well, yes, I know that's what's typed, but is that what your intention was back when you served this on the state? My, my intention was to get an opinion from the doctor uh, as strong as possible that made clear that what happened in this case uh, was a failure of memory systems or consistent with all of his study of failure of memory systems. All right. All right. And when the state served this on April 4th, um, do you recall the state then filing a motion to compel on April 11th, 2016, along with the motion to exclude expert testimony on the ultimate issue under 704, the motion to exclude defendant self-serving hearsay, those three motions on April 11th, 2016. So I don't remember specific dates, but I know that those motions were filed. Let me have a moment to I'm going to have you take a look at what I'm sharing right now. Um, does this help refresh your recollection as to the date the state's motion to compel discovery was filed? April 11, 2016. All right. And do you recall that what the state asserted at this point in time in its motion to compel was that on April 6th of 2016, um, that the state received its discovery and that in the two paragraph summary defendant notes that Diamond actually interviewed the defendant at some unspecified date and time and that the state then spoke with Dr. Diamond via telephone on April 6th, 2016 and that during that conversation, Dr. Diamond disclosed that he created written documentation regarding the statement defendant gave him during his work on this case and that the state specifically only wanted what Ross Harris had told Dr. Diamond in this case, as he was basing his opinion on what the defendant had told him. So um, I wasn't privy to the conversation between Dr. Diamond and the state, uh, but I can tell you that that is, um, that the pleading there uh, does not demonstrate what the court ordered that we turn over. Fair enough. At this point in time, when you received this motion to compel on April 11th of 2016, did you ask Dr. Diamond to look at his notes so that you could review them to see what it was the state wanted? I don't recall uh, the specific language of the conversation, but I definitely spoke to him and let him know that uh, we had been directed to turn over, uh, to turn, turn over his notes regarding or uh, I don't remember how I phrased it, but I made clear that he, we were going to have to turn over uh, anything related to um, his uh, conversations or interviews with Ross. And you let him know this after you got this motion to compel? Yes. 
And the first day of trial for the first go around in Marietta, that started on April 11th, 2016. And jury selection began the next day on April 12th. Is that right? That sounds right. I don't have specific recall of the dates. But it will be in the record. Sure. All right. And what happened with the case as it proceeded here in Marietta? Mistried. And what was decided then? That the case was going to be moved to another jurisdiction. Do you remember the date it was mistried? I do not. How many days were you into the case before the mistrial happened? Seems like it was a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks or so. So we get to the, well, the, the second interview, the first interview Dr. David Diamond did with your client, Mr. Harris, was back in 2015. Is that correct? The, the first interview or the second interview? First interview Dr. Diamond did with Ross Harris. Um, I apologize. I just simply do not have a... Um, I just don't have a sufficient reference to tell you with any certainty when these inter when, when when Dr. Diamond spoke with Ross. I only know that he did, um, but it was it, it was certainly uh, prior to trial, um, and it seems to me that it it would have had to have been uh, no earlier than 2015. And so. The next time he spoke with your client would have been April 30th of 2016. Is that correct? I, I just, Dr. Diamond would be a better historian for that than, than me. I just don't, I, I, I can't tell you the date. All right, well, I'm gonna ask you to direct your attention here to the uh, typed up notes and materials. You recognize these three pages as defense exhibit one? Of course. What's the date at the top of that? Uh, 4 30, 2016. So at this point in time, the trial has already begun on April 11th in Marietta. There's been a mistrial. And at this point in time, you know it's going to be continued and moved to a different location. Is that right? Um, I'm just, I'm not crystal clear on the dates, but if that's, uh, I don't have any reason to doubt, to doubt you regarding the dates. Okay. So when Dr. Diamond goes to do this particular interview on April 30th of 2016, you'd already been prepared to go to trial once already, right? Uh, we were constantly preparing for trial. There was never a, a <laughs> there was never a stoppage of preparing for trial. All right, but by the time he does this second interview on April 30th, 2016, you'd already served the CV, the two paragraphs, and a 22-slide PowerPoint presentation to go along with Dr. Diamond's testimony for trial. That sounds right. So looking at defense exhibit number one, this section up here where it says first level criteria for my involvement in this case, this is actually Dr. Diamond talking about what criteria he use about, uses about whether he's going to get involved in a case or not, right? That's my belief that that's what that is. So you're, you were worried the state was going to cross-examine him on the fact that he's- That's a big speculation on this witness's part now. He said that's his belief, but he doesn't know what's uh, in Dr. Diamond's head, but Dr. Diamond has already testified to that. Well, nothing on cross. This has no attitude than that, and I'll allow it for objection. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Kilgore, what I'm go getting to is you've testified repeatedly about the, why this document worried you so much. This got in the hands of the state, and the state was going to use it terribly to cross-examine Dr. Diamond. So I kind of want to go through that with you to explore exactly what about this document caused you so much concern. So the first part, this first level criteria, that's about Dr. Diamond. The state would have basically, I mean, your, in your opinion, this is one of the reasons you didn't put this Dr. Diamond on the stand. So. No, no ma'am, you're, you're, you're putting words, you're putting words in my mouth. 
Okay. And and it sounds like you're 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 uh, mocking my direct testimony. Um, so let me let me make the record real clear. Um, I don't recall testifying that I had a problem with anything about that interview one, that one through four. I, I don't believe that I, I testified about that on direct. Um, and, and I don't believe that I had any concern about that. But I, I will assure you, ma'am, we, we were extraordinarily worried about the, the rest of that document uh, getting to the state and them having it to not only cross-examine Diamond, but suggest uh, suggest and put words in Ross's mouth. Uh, we were very concerned about it. How would the state go about putting words in Ross Harris's mouth? Sure. Well, um, I can't tell you what they would have done. That would I be can tell you. Correct? I could tell you what they could have done. Um, and uh, any line that is on there. Uh, they could have suggested that these were things that, that Ross had said. Um, and, um, uh, um, and of course, they could have suggested that these were things that the um, uh, expert was worried about, that the expert was concerned about after talking to counsel. Um, it, because it's on paper, uh, the state could use its imagination to make those words mean anything they wanted to uh, in order to fit their narrative, to fit their theory. Uh, and in fact, that's what the state did throughout this case. That is going on all afternoon. Mr. Kilgore, if Dr. Diamond is, you're an experienced trial attorney, correct? Uh, I have tried uh, jury trials before, yes, ma'am. So when a witness is on the stand and the opposing side mischaracterizes some testimony or something, what do you normally do? Uh, obviously object. Right, and at that point, can the witness himself or herself actually clarify their answer and explain what's really going on and what the truth is and how the person, lawyer questioning them is completely wrong. So um, the answer to that question is, is obviously yes, uh, but I believe that is far too simplistic uh, 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 concept of what being in trial is really like. Uh, because what can happen is the state can take that piece of paper uh, they could take the words that are on paper and they could tell, uh, stand in closing argument and say, well, David Diamond says those aren't his words or he says that's not what he meant. Uh, who who you going to believe? You, you going to believe the guy who was paid by the defense or your lying eyes right here on this paper? So your concern with this being in the hands of the state is that Chuck Boring was going to be such a good advocate that he was going to go ahead and twist all of this up in a knot for Dr. Diamond and Ross Harris and then make these sorts of closing arguments. So your fear was actually of the state's attorneys being so good? You betcha. You okay. betcha. Look, look at the very first line in the state's closing argument. Uh, I love my son and all, but we all need escapes. Okay, that, that was something that uh, Ross had, had uh, typed out in a, uh, in a chat with somebody. Uh, totally benign, absolutely benign. But, but yet the, the uh, state made those words appear what they wanted them to appear to be. They, the state put its meaning to those words. Um, and a mediocre lawyer can do that. Uh, and the lawyers in this case were better than mediocre. They were very good. Um, so yes, I, I was extraordinary. All the lawyers were extraordinarily worried that when you put something in writing that was conversations between the lawyers and the expert, that the uh, prosecutors were going to be able to throw that back at us and use it to make it make those words mean whatever they wanted them to mean to fit the state's narrative. So
Listen, we would have called Dr. Diamond to testify in this case if we hadn't <laughs> had to turn those notes over. That's the bottom line. He would have testified if I hadn't been required to turn those notes over. I'm so, not sure what's exactly going on right now. Y'all are talking over one another. I'm not sure why. Oh, uh, let's quit for the day. I've got to call that criminal calendar from this afternoon and get it wrapped up. Y'all been working hard all afternoon since one. We'll resume until nine in the morning. So this matter is in recess. Thank you, Judge. Yes. Thank you, Judge. I've learned how to find the mute button. <laughs> That can be convenient. <laughs> well, I think my wife wants me to have wants one of these herself. So. I wasn't going to say it, but I did think it. <laughs> all right, y'all have a good afternoon. I've got other things to address. I'll see you all in the morning. All right, what do we have going on? What's left? Mr. Is that Mr. Winkler's? Yeah. Mr. Winkler, what is your announcement on the status calendar? Your Honor, uh, we were coming back on uh, motion on Anthony Justice. The state had requested some additional time to contact uh, a number of victims in this case. It was taking us some time to locate them since it was such an old case, but we have successfully made contact with each of the victims. Um, this was, uh, again, just uh, State of Georgia versus Anthony Justice. It was a 02-2840 uh, case. Um, and I was able to pull the file from archives. We were able to locate each of the victims and make contact with them. Um, so I had some announcements on their behalf and just um, since I have had a chance to review the file, um, I did just want to state from the state's position. This was a case where uh, I believe there were a total of four individuals charged in the robbery of a pet smart. Um, one of the individuals elected to have a trial uh, the others entered pleas, Mr. Anthony Justice being one of the individuals that did enter a plea on the case. Um, and he received a sentence of uh, 15 to serve 11, followed by a consecutive 10 years on probation. Um, we have made contact with a no each of the victims in this case. The essential facts of it were that a group of men entered a pet smart at closing time um, presented objects that appeared to be handguns um, and had a manager, Miss uh, Georgette, uh, open the safe to the business to take some money out of it. Um, the guns turned out to be BB guns. Uh, Mr. Justice was identified by Georgette as um, a former employee, she recognized his voice during the course of it. Um, Miss Georgette Frangi, we did speak with her. She indicated that um, since the time has passed since this all occurred, um, that she was not opposed. Um, she was more indifferent and would leave it to the court's discretion. Um, we also spoke with uh, a Katie Larson, she was another employee. She indicated that she was not opposed uh, based on the time that had passed. Uh, the remaining three victims, uh, Greg Wolf, Ryan Cook, and Jody Green, um, each did indicate opposition. Um, from the state's position on it, um, we would oppose early termination. Um, just because we would we would say it's we don't believe it's ripe at this point in time. Um, not to say that he would we would never agree to terminate it early, uh, but the state's position would be just not enough time has passed uh, for us to consent to an early termination. At